this is the most expected, most anticipated recession right. ever. To be historically unique, to not go into recession. We do have the unemployment rate rising. Um, you know, that is enough of a, you know, it's a high enough rate to cause a, a mild recession. You'll see a recovery before, before you get out of the recession. Our baseline is that the U.S. economy will avoid recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. We're looking at potato au gratin recipes as we stagger to the weekend as well. Lisa's looking to get away. Good luck with that. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's such sweet wishes. We welcome all Good of you on a right. Friday before the holiday. Yes, we're all off next week, which is a great and beautiful thing. Thank you to our staff for making that happen. But we have an overlay of things here. I want to get this out of the way first. We are thrilled that Bob Diamond will um, <laughs> have trouble getting it out. We are thrilled that Bob Diamond will be with us in the eight o'clock hour to speak of his dear friend, Scott Miner. That's the first order of business. We'll talk about Mr. Miner through the show. All of us here at Surveillance and Absolute shock. No other yeah. way. No other way to put it. Also, we're in shock over the mother of all storms. I mean, people allude back to 1978, Lisa, and uh, this is the real deal. It was. It was a biblical rain coming in today. Yeah, it definitely, and and that's going to freeze over and create a pretty treacherous situation. There's the you say weather gloom. Like, Can you see I mean, Lisa as a weather okay. person? <laughs> it's going to rain Folks for the rest get, of it's your worse life. Than you then, can imagine. <laughs> I mean, look, hopefully I get out. Hopefully you all get out. And if you had a flight, I hope it wasn't one of the 3,500 3, that have been canceled. This is going to be a busy moment. And everyone is trying to get away. Today, you cannot leave <clears throat> because there is important data. There is important discussions about how next year is going to be a pivot point in many different ways and not perhaps the yeah. way that people want. As well as Bob Diamond, Michael McKee will be with us. He was missing yesterday, but uh, it's important to get it up. And look at the data dump today. We have Michigan survey that... You know, okay, it was there, but now it's important. Durable goods, part of that GDP calculation, and PCE deflator is what Mike McKee's going to focus on. And we'll walk through all of the data. It comes <clears throat> after investors just pulled the most right. ever out of stock funds in the past week, in the week through December. I missed that. 21st. Really? Yes. Really? $42 billion from equities. This was from Well, that bill finally went to cash. You, know. you also had money withdrawn from bonds. This is a question. Have we reached the end of the withdrawal of free money, right. of the end of the tightening, or is this the beginning of a cascade that a lot of people are expecting at the beginning of next year? So we're going to have an interesting show. We hope you stay with us through all of surveillance today. Are you doing the 9 o'clock, or do you exit right after the show? I'm trying to fly out of here. <clears throat> You're so we'll flying out. Is, I, well, there's a lot, a lot of people making it up here in New York City, and we hope that you are safe. I looked at Chicago. I think it was minus 8 with a wind chill minus 20, and you moved east to, say, Columbus, Ohio, 2 above 0 and it was 40 degrees in Pittsburgh. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with here in heavy uh, rains, and we'll get you through. On radio, Rob Carroll, and we'll have important reports uh, for you as well. And we've got uh, Brian K. Sullivan up in Boston with us uh, later on. What we're going to do here, because we have an optimist on with us, we're going to get Lisa to do the brief. I'll do the data. Why don't you do the, Are you ready to do the brief yet? Yeah, are you sure. still making it up? Well, I'm, I'm always making it up, but what we're looking at today, there are some really important data points, and this is notable because it is light yes. volumes and everybody data wants dump. to get out, data dump. but it is a data dump. 8.30 a.m., a read on the consumer. We get U.S. personal spending and income for November. We have seen personal spending come off. Real personal spending is expected to just inch higher. However, the question here is the resilience and PCE core deflator. This is the key inflation metric looked at by the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> yes, it's expected to come down, but not that much. Much. There is not necessarily the downward trajectory that's as direct as with the broader CPI index. At 10 a.m., we get the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey for December as well as November new home sales. How much does sentiment continue to bleed upward? We saw that in some of the recent data. And this particular well, and survey— yesterday as well. Yeah, and it really tracks— Energy, oil prices, gasoline okay. prices. And so you might see that inverse relationship come through. On the data front, I'm going to call it a churn. It's a bounce up big two days ago, down big yesterday. And right now, fractionally up futures up 16. The VIX is really, to me, the VIX is telling of this December uh, week. We're, we ought to be out 23, 24. We are not. We're at 21.82 on the VIX. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index gives Chairman Powell accommodation, not restriction. Some curved dynamics, a little bit of a uh, disinversion, I guess I'll call it the two-year yield 4.28%. Uh, 
percent worth of watching as well. And we note as we look at the data that John Farrell on his way to Cornwall still moving past Bath and Exeter, heavy rains in southern England. Just wanted to let you know, the other thing on my agenda is at 2 p.m., the bond market closes early. I and did not know that. Oh, marks okay. a coda to a year that has been coda. incredibly dramatic. Okay, are we, we going to celebrate with an auction here at 159? <laughs> no, PM? I'm not going to celebrate with an auction. We <clears throat> okay. can celebrate with a tank. I, but I just wanted to say, it's been a mark, remarkable month okay. this month. This can, can we get one of the in, Amy? Can we get one of the interns over here? Can you do an eight-page paper by 12 noon on why the equity market's not closing at two? Do we have any idea why? No clue. No clue. Can't it's help just, you. I, it's good. News you can use. Yeah. <laughs> Bond market closing at two. John Stolfus knew that, chief investment strategist at Oppenheim or Opco, and we're thrilled he could join us uh, this morning. John, what's so important here is you've been a bull with a select few others. You have maintained your bullish stance, and like an adult, you have the courage to move out the x-axis into 2023. We've done the same thing with the recession call. We've moved the recession call out into 2023. Is your bullishness and the recession call out, are they linked? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, to some uh, extent, you know, there is risk of a recession. We had that montage that you showed uh, uh, just a little between the uh, uh, between the, the points of the show in the commercial section. And you can, everybody with, is speaking with great authority, whether it's those that believe we're moving into a recession or not. No one really knows. Uh, we belong to the camp that we think we might skirt a recession, or if we do a recession, it'll be relatively light. Um, the economy's resilience is pretty clear by the economic data. <clears throat> right. if anything, good news yesterday turned into bad news for the market, as people thought it, it gave the Fed reason to extend right. uh, raising rates for longer. Uh, and we'd have to think that, uh, you know, there's an opportunity as 12 months ahead of us uh, to really see the markets come back. Uh, we don't think it's going to be uh, uh, necessarily a year of robustness, but one in which resilience shows that we can move right. back towards sustainable oh, economy. John, Lisa Bramowitz is too young to remember FIFO, LIFO, first in, first out and all that. And there I was looking at Nike's inventory success of moving sneakers out after they bought too many or had too many during the pandemic. Well, how do you extrapolate the good news of FedEx and Nike a few days ago out into Stolfus optimism for next year? Well, we'd have to say it, uh, we think that's evidence of, of exceptional management teams uh, utilizing technology to arrive at solutions to help them navigate through really uh, turbulent waters. And we've seen corporations do this through the pandemic. Earlier, they did it through the financial crisis recovery period. And we think they're working on it right now. It's not that all corporations will succeed in that. But uh, the better ones will. So that's one of the reasons, whether you're in small, mids, or large, we, or growth or value, we suggest you go for quality here. One shift that we've heard in tone, John, is people pushing back their expectations of when the recession will start just because of that optimism that you're seeing in corporations. Is that a good news scenario longer term for stocks, or is that just a good term kind of short-term trading opportunity? I actually think it's a it's a good term. Uh, 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 it, it's good for the longer term in here. I, I'll never forget in 09, we were early on the bullish call in 09, and everybody was always looking for the next shoe to, to fall. It was always with an authoritative stance, and it just didn't really happen. And uh, we think that uh, this year, uh, 2023, the new year, is going to be a, 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 a take it back to where we once belonged in the sense that we're, we're going to see fundamentals become more important rather than momentum and projecting anything negative today forward negative into infinity. We think better things are, are yet to come. And some of the evidence proves just in those two companies uh, that Tom mentioned, it's, it's uh, good things can happen here with good management. I want to pick up on what you said, uh, that next year it'll be more of a fundamental story. Which stocks or sectors do you think didn't trade on fundamentals this year when we saw the biggest sell-off in equities going back to 2008? You know, I've got to say, the first thing is to remember that the sell-off, the maximum drawdown, well, let's just say the, the, the total decline was about 48% in, uh, in, in, in 08. And this year, uh, where are we down uh, uh, 19% or so, 18%, 19% right now, and we've been worse than, than that. 
But at the same time, uh, it, it, this isn't 08. It's a very different uh, structure that we have here. So we would have to have to say when we look at the at, at the environment, it appears to us that there's a lot of opportunity for positive surprises coming out of this. A part of it is, you know, right. we don't think Jerome Powell wants to go down as, as the in history. There you as go. The first Fed chair it took us into a bad recession. Right. John, big tech, final question. Big tech, everybody hates it, massively unloved. Stolfus on big tech. Yeah, I, I really like big tech, uh, but I like big tech, the big tech that is embedded in the daily lives of individuals and corporations, uh, not from a, a social media perspective, but more towards uh, a, a manufactured uh, products and right. equipment, very much the industrial sector. We like industrials because yeah. it's so heavily uh, embedded with technology. So I, I we like tech industrials. Yeah. John, I know you can't mention individual securities, but hold still while I take a photo with my iPhone of you. John Stolfus there, not mentioning Apple. He's with Opco, and uh, we thank him for his optimism along with Binkham Chada and others uh, this year. John Golub was great yesterday um, as well. I, can we just generalize that it, you know, I, not to bust your chops, Bramo, but it's pretty gloomy out there. I, I mean, <laughs> look at the bond market combined with the equity market. You got to go back 40, 50 years. I actually don't think it's all that gloomy considering what we just saw, which was a historic move away from easy money GDP. Com uh, commentary. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, but but the, if you look at what people are saying, they're saying, well, perhaps recession is delayed. <clears throat> perhaps it's pushed out there. Perhaps there won't even be a recession. The soft landing has made a rebound. I mean, We've heard I, this uh, so much more over the past couple of weeks. I'm looking at the survey, Mike McKee again at 830, personal income. I think it's a plunge, 0.7% to 0.3%. As well, I don't know if we have a shot of this yet. It's darkness at dawn for Lisa. She's traveling uh, today. We are in torrential downpours here uh, in New York. There's no other way to are put you just it. Are trying to troll me? Uh, no. There's no way I'm going to get this out. Is, this is a <laughs> shot, folks, from the top of Lisa's apartment. Uh, uh. It's a really beautiful shot. We're going to send Shanali Bassick out to Roosevelt Field, but uh, that didn't work out. She's going to join us later on, on uh, Goldman Sachs on the view forward on Wall Street. You made you well. like war correspondent commentary from the airport. Yeah. We're waiting in line. That's where Lindbergh took We're not out sure from. whether we can get out. Charles Lindbergh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jake, it, was, it was, you know, a few years ago. Stay with us. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Elon Musk says he's not planning to sell any Tesla shares for at least 18 months. Speaking on Twitter spaces, Musk also said he favors a share buyback once the company is more confident in the direction of the economy. The Tesla CEO has offloaded almost $40 billion worth of his stock this year, mostly to fund his purchase of Twitter. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried has been released on a $250 million bail package after his first U.S. court appearance on fraud charges. A prosecutor calls it one of the largest pretrial bonds in U.S. history. The package includes a personal bond secured by his parents' house in California. Its terms require Bankman Freed to stay with him and submit to electronic monitoring. His next court appearance is scheduled for January 3rd. And Meta has agreed to pay $725 million to settle a long-running lawsuit that claimed Facebook illegally shared user data with the research firm Cambridge Analytica. Facebook users sued after it was revealed that the UK research firm connected to Donald Trump's 2016 campaign for president gained access to the data of as many as 87 million of the social media network's subscribers. A massive winter storm is hitting a huge portion of the central U.S. Thousands of flights are canceled. The National Weather Service says more than 200 million people, around 60 percent of the nation's population, are under some form of winter weather warning or advisory, wreaking havoc on America's travel plans ahead of Christmas. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We believe we have real needs on the defense side now with Ukraine more than ever, but we believe there are just as many and just as important real needs on the um, domestic side. Now, we got a whole lot done here. The budget was bigger. 
Senator Schumer, I believe a Democrat from New York, and we uh, uh, I can confirm wish that. him. You can confirm that. <laughs> yeah. Abramo, it's on top of the story this morning. The Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, there after a really interesting year in politics uh, in America. Lisa wants to talk COVID in China. We're going to well, do that in a moment because this is a really burgeoning story. I, I just did the math. This is off of Google this morning, and this is the fiction that's out there, Lisa. China deaths from COVID zero. Seven day average one. <laughs> right. It is a fiction. Well, and everybody kind of, it's an open secret that it's a fiction. Xi Jinping, uh, the president of China, has yet to comment on this. And yes, they did pass the omnibus spending <clears throat> bill at Senate, did, and now it goes over to the House for passage. And that's why uh, we have Chuck Schumer there announcing that. What's next? Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, was talking with his counterpart in China, saying, Let us help you. We are worried about the lack of transparency. We are worried about the virus cases ripping through the nation, the lack of information, this could spark What uh, can the Secretary of State do? I feel like we're talking about the you know, SEC Department of Justice and Binance. Okay, great. Wring our hands. What can we do? He's saying, please, let us send you some gear. Let us send you some vaccines. Let us help you get this under control. We dealt with this also. They haven't gotten anyone to take them up on that. Well, I think it's, it's uh, coming out of anti-science to be optimistic and we'll We'll have to see. It's a story unfolding, and of course, uh, into this weekend, I'm sure you know it's it's, it's going to be a full time effort for everyone uh, as well. Futures up 12, Dow futures up 111 this morning. There's trading. Bramo reporting, surveillance reporting the market, the bond market closing at 2 p.m. Uh, as well. And then they stagger into the final week with a bond price down, what, 15% on a blended basis? Bloomberg total return yeah. index, worst case for the year. Yeah, and a little worst, bit of a bounce. Yeah, and worst uh, performance going back decades and decades, questionably, whether potentially ever. Yeah, yeah well, well, we'll have uh, to see uh, right now. I think we've got, do we have Terry yes, Ains, we Amy? Have Terry. I haven't heard from Amy. I'm looking at the control. Oh, the control room's out. Okay, we have Terry Haynes. Terry Haynes, thank you so much for joining us with Pangea Policy. And I want to talk about the philosophical idea, Mr. Haynes. This is reporting. This is out of the post. Well, Bloomberg has it as well. Basically, selected Republicans sat on their hands for Mr. Zelensky. Bobert Getz, Burchett, others didn't even bother showing up as Mr. McCarthy played with his microphone stand. And what I find fascinating, Terry is the Post does a body count and says a few Republicans felt that way, as you said to us a couple days ago. And yet I see out in the Republican zeitgeist that this is a huge opinion of Republicans. Which is it? How narrow is that top part of the Republican Party? Well, good morning, Tom and Lisa. I think what you get here is a situation where you, you know, you've got sort of fringes on both sides. We've we've long talked about uh, the four factions in the Congress as opposed yeah. to the two parties. And what you have is four factions here. What what Republicans I think want is they want accountability on Ukraine funding, and that's fine. They can get that in a variety of different ways. Uh, but they're also trying to make political points. Shocker, I know, but uh, the political points on uh, kind of. You know, fiscal restraints, uh, too much debt, that sort of thing. And so I think that's uh, that's where you see the uh, the fill-in more than anything else. Well, to, to drag us into next year, Mr. Haynes, if the most interesting battle, we don't know what President Biden's going to do, but if it's Republican, the fact is President Trump has a core Republican constituency of a certain size. Do you as a grizzled pro think they will actually switch their creed, their faith, their religion over to somebody else? I mean, are they going to shift? I think some of them will, yeah. Uh, my view uh, uh, now has been for a while that I think President Trump has really jumped the shark on uh, it, it politically. And it's a combination of two things. One, it's a combination of the January 6th uh, and post-January 6th behavior. Uh, and that's combined with the fact that uh, he's now committed the other unforgivable sin in politics, uh, which is that he's, he's a serial loser. And uh, going back to the 2020 elections and now most recently the midterms and the Georgia runoff. So what you have here is somebody who is 
among other things, suggesting that the Constitution should be suspended uh, to accommodate his theories about the 2020 election, uh, plus being a serial loser. Republican Party has been trying to get past Trump for some time, and uh, this has only made uh, this combination has only made things uh, much more urgent. So, yeah, I think they do. And they're engaged in a dance to try to keep as many of those Trump-like supporters as possible. But they have been for a while. I think they get some of them, yeah. But it's to the point now where Republican leaders think it's more important to preserve the brand than it is to worry over much about Trump. Well, we strip away the political drama. There is a question after 2022, what will be the main issues, the main flashpoints, the main economic challenges in 2023, which was the reason why I was pointing to the story of China and the U.S. pushing them to accept aid from the United States to try to sure. curtail some of the virus spread. How important is this story, do you think, in shaping 2023? politically? Oh, I think it's very important. Uh, what you have is a situation where, you know, the, the overture from Secretary of State Lincoln uh, shows that the, the United States is, is continues to be very interested in constructive engagement uh, with the People's Republic of China and with their government and, uh, and, and wants to be helpful wherever it can. You know, there's a subtext here, of course, which is, uh, you know, we can help you uh, means they can't help themselves to some extent. And, uh, you know, that's a problem, as you pointed out, that uh, the Chinese government uh, is uh, probably can't get over uh, quickly or easily. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it shows an outstretched hand. It shows a concern for uh, the humanitarian side of the tragedy that's been unfolding in China in some time. Uh, you know, that's all to the good. But what you see is kind of the push-pull of, uh, of U.S.-China relations. And, you know, you know, I think that'll continue, and it is very important for 2023. What about immigration? And I ask this because we have been talking about the worker shortage, and yet there still is this fight over the legacy COVID-era immigration restrictions left over from President, former President Trump's reign. How much do you see Republicans getting on board with Democrats in 2023 on allowing more immigration? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the the immigration policy in this country is broken. That's obvious. Uh, what's a little less obvious is it's been broken for almost uh, at least a decade now, frankly, at least a decade. Uh, this The last time the parties tried to engage constructively <clears throat> on immigration policy was back in 2013. Uh, since then, they haven't, and that's to the country's detriment. Uh, as a citizen, I certainly hope they will. But there is, uh, there's a gulf between the two parties on lots of things, uh, including a path to citizenship. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the last time this was engaged with constructively, there was a, uh, a centrist coalition that really tried to bridge the gap. Uh, that's going to be very tough in a world where you have, uh, you know, the two of the four factions being progressive Democrats who want to liberalize immigration and uh, more conservative Republicans who want to not restrict immigration, but put stricter controls and uh, on making sure that people are in the country legally. Uh, you know, it can be done, but it's going to take a huge amount of effort. The Supreme Court may well kick uh, kick that off uh, with a ruling on Title 42 here right. over the coming weeks. So I'd look for that sooner rather than later. Terry Haynes, thank you for the brief on this uh, Friday of December. Mr. Haynes is with Pangea Policy. This happened overnight. I wasn't even aware of it until 10 uh, minutes ago. Last season, Lisa, my absolute favorite baseball game of the year was a guy pitching for the San Francisco Giants who looked out of 40 years ago. His name is Carlos Rodon. And I'm not stunned, but here he is signing with the Yankees. The Yankees win. There's no other way to, to put it. This is a spectacular sign. This is as important as signing Aaron Judge. Well, and Yankee fans had, before he even signed, sent him money through I, Venmo to try to get right. him on, to try to take matters into their own hands. I love Yankee, that. I would pay a thousand bucks to see Rodon go after Verlander and Yankees Mets. Good morning. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, everyone, on radio and television. We hope you're safe, particularly out driving with Bloomberg Radio. We assume you're not watching Bloomberg Television in your car. Coast to coast, challenges of ice, 
that dreaded dark ice over the truly torrential rains on the East Coast uh, that we see right now. We're going to do a complete data check now. We've got lots of distractions today. Again, I do want to mention that Mr. Diamond, Bob Diamond, will be with us in the 8 o'clock hour in honor of his good friend, Scott Minard. We are all shaken, and we'll get to that uh, through the morning. Right now, though, a data check. Lisa, I'm going to jump on equities with a VIX 21.93, up big, down big. Who knows what will be, and does next week matter? I'm not sure. Uh, SPX up nine points. We've got 100 points on the Dow. Dow 33,300 shows how we've been churning. And it's that moving average convergence where as we talked to Lizanne Saunders about inequities at doldrum. We also don't talk as much about the sell-off this year. And as we end the year, because it really is, it's this bond sell-off, it is the stock sell-off. Do you know that the NASDAQ is down more than 32% on a total return basis since the end of last year? That is almost double what the S&P is down, of 18.5%. These are the kinds of numbers that we're talking about, for, but a 15% decline right. in bonds for the year just traumatic. And so how do we reset? Is this enough? And I think that is one of the key questions going into next well, year. Have we seen truly the full withdrawal of free money, uh, or is this the beginning of a new era of investing? And my answer to it, as we heard from John Stolfus, is profit is a differentiator. And, you know, we saw it with Apple's share buyback. Apple went down less than other profitable and non-profitable tax. But it'll be really interesting to see use of cash next year. And if that in in cash free cash flow, if that helps divide the market from the gloom you're talking about over to people that can keep on. What do we do with oil? We were looking yeah. at sixty nine six, seven days ago. We're now up at seventy nine dollars, West Texas Intermediate, up a dollar thirty one Brent crude out to eighty two dollars. I should call it Brent Dog <laughs> I'm sure people would love down it. To 80. People would yeah. love it. Also we should mention the dollar. And the weakness that we've seen. And really, that's another big right. debate heading into next year. And Kit Meeks <coughs> was really uh, yeah, fun on that this um, morning, talking about how perhaps we will get a weaker dollar that will give life to some of the riskier yeah. assets throughout the world. Citigroup, with a small note off the Tokyo desk this morning, saying they don't think they can sustain the bond purchases of pulling in essentially private peoples and companies' bonds into the government through February. They can't get to March with their present strategy. So Citigroup alluding that the decision tree for the Bank of Japan and the people of Japan is a lot closer than some people think. Especially after the inflation data came out of Japan yesterday Did overnight. You see that? And it was once again the yeah. fastest pace since 1981, 3.7 suppressed by subsidies to a whole host of things that the government yeah. is trying to keep that down. With core inflation now exceeding their price target for eight straight months, there is a yeah. theory out there the that Haruki uh, Kuroda would like to get ahead of right. his exit in April. Because he has the credibility. He doesn't want to leave the mess to his successor right. to be able to lift the Band-Aid at this point. This complete data check, the final data point, which we only do because Ms. Greifeld is here, Bitcoin uh, down 65%. It was at 60000 and then at the beginning of the year, the vicinity of 50000 it's not there today. It's called doing a Tesla. She joins us now. Katie Greifeld of crypto fame and glory as well. Open question. When you woke up today, what did you focus on in the crypto world and the zeitgeist that's out there? I mean, all the focus is still on Sam Bankman. -Fried. Still on the soap opera of this guy. Coming. That's what Are it is. Are you kidding me? It's of course. Of course. It's the biggest news in the crypto industry right now. It's the only news that we have, really, in terms of when you think about where the potential next shoe to drop is right now. Right. What we know <clears throat> for sure is happening is what's going on with Sam Bankman fried because it's playing out so publicly. Obviously, the news yesterday was the $250 million I, I, I don't want to bail bonds. Yeah, but, uh, th uh, this was a silly conversation. Mm -hmm. The adults are saying, would everybody calm down? This is the way it works. And however it works with his parents home and that baloney. Were you surprised this clown didn't plead guilty coming off the plane? It is interesting. That is the next obvious point to watch in today? this story. Well, his next appearance is January 3rd. So maybe not today, but that's what we're watching for. He has maintained up until he was arrested and the media tour ended that he wasn't committing intentional fraud at FTX, that it was just basically gross mismanagement. That gets harder to defend when you have the likes right. of Caroline Ellison, <clears throat> when you have the likes of Gary Wang flipping, cooperating with prosecutors and saying, no, this was fraud. Okay, I, I get that this is, I feel like it's Musk. It's like almost a celebrity thing. And I, I know John Farrell's on the same page as I am. I don't know where you are on this, Lisa, but I'm, 
I'm sort of like offended by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. What I see in your world, and I'm speaking from a distance, you know how negative I am on this idiocy, is everything's about Binance. What should our viewers and listeners focus on with this strange, maybe Cayman Island, foreign company, the DOJ can't get their tentacles around? What do we look for from Binance into the last week of the year? The biggest thing to know about Binance right now is we report out what is going on there is just how big it is. According to some data we have, it has 53% of market volume in November. It's hard to overstate how big this exchange is. So when I see Bitcoin on a Saturday morning going like this, much of that's going off Binance's desk? Especially now with FTX out of the game. And so 53% of total market share, two-thirds of derivatives trading in the crypto space is going through Binance. And actually, remember, we had those Senate hearings in December. It feels like a year ago, but that was just in this month. You had Tennessee Senator Bill Haggerty saying that if we hypothetically saw a similar implosion at Binance, that would be catastrophic for the industry. Like Tom was pointing out, Bitcoin, it's not really doing much. It sounds 65% year to date, but hasn't really wiggled around too much in the past month and a half. If Binance goes under, that's potentially an entirely different story. There are three reasons why I am fascinated by this drama. You said you didn't know where I stood on this, Tom, so I will tell you where I stood and stand on this. Number one, there is a theory out there that the current regulation was sufficient to cover this, right? Mm. And that has been the line from a lot of Congress members as well as the SEC. So this really raises a question of what went wrong. Number two, there is a question of culpability, how much he basically shunts the guilt because he gave a lot of the money away. And then there's the political angle, all of the donations. So let's start with the first one, that regulations were sufficient to stop this. Where are they saying that? What are they looking at in terms of transparency, in terms of oversight, that was sufficient to prevent this if you hadn't been so clever to get around it? What's the theory here? I think it's hard to say that regulations were in a sufficient place where it could have stopped this, given that it didn't stop this, that this still happened. And I mean, for the past... Two years, really, we've been having philosophical discussions about who actually has oversight over some of these crypto companies. You think about FTX, for example, headquarters in in the Bahamas, but a lot of U.S. customers lost money. So it's it's a question. And then now you're seeing three different agencies, the DOJ, the CFTC, the SEC, come out and you know charge FTX and some of these in players involved. It feels like obviously there was a failure here and where it goes from here there's obviously a push of fuel to do something what that actually looks like the regulatory picture i'm not sure there's also the issue of people highly intelligent highly capable innovative innovators who are celebrated as such Mm -hmm. who basically were playing with monopoly money Mm -hmm. and there is a question of whether it indicts an entire industry of people who are creative and innovative and trying to come up with something new but essentially are playing with monopoly money how much is that what people are talking about in terms of select corners and the sort of intellectual heft that is being put into what could be great innovation well i think that's a really interesting sort of narrative, because at the end of the day, this was pretty simple in terms of the fraud that was committed, because you had one entity, FTX, money was coming in from customers, and they were funneling it to Alameda, a different company. They weren't supposed to do that. And then maybe the stuff that Alameda did with that money in terms of the trading that went on was a little bit more complicated and sophisticated. But at the end of the day, it was pretty simple. I forget exactly how John J. Ray III phrased it. He's the new CEO of FTX. Mm -hmm. He handled Enron's liquidation. But he said something along the lines of, this is just old-fashioned embezzlement. How much of the money is going to get recouped? That's also an open question. There's still billions out there that's left to recover. Uh, That process is ongoing, but it's expected to take years. What are the... We were watching Tesla employed. I don't know where Tesla is this morning. It had a really ugly day yesterday. I think it's on the bid this morning. Uh, Good news for Mr. Musk. But what are the ramifications to these players? And again, I circle back to Binance and frankly, the, the, the legal and the alleged criminal activity that flows through Binance, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But the answer is, what's the ramifications of 16,800 Bitcoin becoming, say, 13,000? Does the price of Bitcoin matter in the, in the crypto world of Keeley yeah. lines? 
<laughs> well, the price of Bitcoin matters if you're a Bitcoin miner, for example. We know that that entire industry See, she has does been... this just to get me going, you know. <laughs> okay, so Bitcoin miner, they're not actually out there with picks and shovels, but you think about the hardware that they have to buy, how much money that they've locked up in these machines. Uh, it's very capital intensive, actually. Even Are though they affected talking... by the cold if these clowns move from China to Texas? Yeah. And they're doing electrical generation in Texas. Does two below zero in Abilene matter? Oh, big time. I mean, a lot of crypto miners that are in Texas miners. have had to shut off their machines to, you know, alleviate some of the stress on the grid when you do have extreme weather. So what does Texas. that do to the price? In terms of the price, uh, maybe the, the direct effect from the miners to the price isn't there, but the price affects the miner. It affects those companies. You've seen a wave of bankruptcies in the crypto mining space. So there's your big problem. I'm just keeping Speechless. my mouth shut. That, yeah, that, that silence way. you heard, folks, was a surveillance cork in my mouth. <laughs> Katie, th I think thank you so much. No, thank you. Crypto. I think this is really interesting because there is an issue with innovation. How do you foster innovation and the new concepts to uh, potentially create some interesting infrastructure that could make things better while weeding out bad actors? How do you do that? And this really throws a damper you on that and it raises a question. Okay, I'm in trouble now. Uh, you can't weed out the bad actors if the underlying doesn't exist, and that's the debate. Ms. Greifeld will say, Tom, you don't A know tool of commerce about. is something that we're talking about. The a tool, tool of commerce of exchanging is value. A, it's a currency button on the Bloomberg. It's a yellow uh, button, and I believe it has not acted like a currency recently. I Maybe will just, Zimbabwe, but... You know. I will, well, sure. I mean, you can point to El Salvador. They tried <clears> to peg their currency to Bitcoin. It didn't work out very well. There's just an interesting, oh, also, right, technology underpinning Where the hell really is Pharaoh? John, come home. Save me. I think me. he would agree with me. That's oh, what I oh think. you think so? I think so. Okay. We'll have to we'll find have out. To find out. Yeah. Call from a payphone outside <laughs> Exeter on your way to Cornwall. Katie Gre Greifeld, thank you so much. In the eight o'clock hour, on our dear, dear friend Scott Miner, we will speak to Bob Diamond. That will be must listen for Global Wall Street. Must watch as well. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol has delivered a scathing report blaming, quote, one man, former President Donald Trump, for inciting violence in an attempt to hold on to power. The 800-page report details Trump's behind-the-scenes fury and his efforts to pressure state officials and the Justice Department to overturn the presidential election. In China, soaring COVID infections are causing a drop in travel and economic activity. The latest high-frequency data shows less traffic congestion in major cities, fewer flights, and fewer people taking the subway. Following the abrupt end to COVID zero controls, more cities have infections leading to crowded hospitals and queues at funeral parlors. Now, China plans to cut quarantine requirements for overseas travelers from next month. Inflation in Japan has further accelerated to the fastest pace since 1981. Consumer prices, excluding fresh food, it climbed 3.7 percent in November from a year ago, matching estimates. The data may fuel speculation that the BOJ will surprise markets again with more policy tightening early in the new year. Guggenheim Partners Chief Investment Officer Scott Minard has died. Guggenheim says in a statement that Minard passed away after a heart attack during his regular workout. He became one of the leaders in fixed income through the 1980s and 90s during stints at Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse First Boston. Scott Minard was 63. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. to be humble. Right now, the labor market is very tight. The Fed is not going to back off in its inflation fight because inflation is just, you know, way above where it needs to be. I think there's a disconnect between what the markets are thinking and where, the, uh, where we're actually going to end up. Uh, but, you know, I think markets are probably expecting the Fed to sort of back off once the economy starts to slow. 
Rabila Farouk, Farouki of High Frequency uh, Economics, our chief U.S. economist uh, this morning. We welcome all of you, Lisa Brownson, and Tom King, John Farrell on assignment, and uh, a most interesting day. We're watching the weather across this nation, torrential rain here in New York City. We hope you are safe as well. As I mentioned, Bob Diamond to come up here on this tragic loss of Scott Minard. We're also looking, of course, here into when Lisa and I uh, exit. But far more than that, we wanted to talk on the state of Wall Street. And with the distraction of the weather, there is only one story in New York. So we speak with Sonali Basak, our Wall Street correspondent, on the travails of the always visible Goldman Sachs. But first, you talked to Scott Minard, frankly, more than I did. Everybody thinks Scott and I were you know, palsy wellsy we weren't, you know, we, we adored each other, et cetera, et cetera, and interviews and that. But you talk to Scott as part of your reporting a lot. And you have a vignette from, I believe, 2020 about what the minor distinction was in the heat of the pandemic. Remember, he had 10% of his portfolio tied to airlines as the pandemic was coming. So everyone thought he was crazy when he was warning about a global shutdown in February of that year, in 2020. But he had to sell, 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 and he locked himself up quite early at that time. Later on, he actually uh, suffered from long COVID for a while, but he did earlier on <clears throat> stop all, stop everything, stop and, and travel, go to California and start selling. There was a moment he pivoted, and it was the absolute bottom of the market. It was March 23rd. That is the lowest day of the S&P. And it was when the Fed stepped in, and he knew – as a Fed watcher, as a Fed critic, frankly, very often, that that would be the pivotal moment that supported the market. And mm -hmm. he put $7 billion to work, including more than a third of that into high yield. I remember that. And honestly, this idea, this nimbleness was also reflected by his life. The ability at age 37 to say, I'm kind of done with this. And no, to move from New feeling. York <clears throat> and go out to California to pursue bodybuilding and being on Venice Beach. And this concept of choosing yourself and basically just going with the, the wind in a way, but also with your gut. How much did he get rewarded for going with his gut at a time when a lot of other people didn't feel that freedom? Often he was criticized for it too. People said his calls were bold and sometimes they were right and sometimes they were wrong, but isn't that everybody on Wall Street, frankly? I think the important thing when it came to Scott is the lesson he always pitched and preached here, which is never hire an optimistic right. bond fund manager. Now, Downside Bob, protection. Bob Diamond uh, with us coming up in the 8 o'clock hour uh, as well. I need to talk about Goldman Sachs. This, uh, Any number of media organizations, it just seems to be at the top of the pile now. How at risk is Mr. Solomon's tenure at Goldman Sachs? Listen, he's into year five. He is hitting some very pivotal marks coming up, which is the investor day coming up early next year, as well as a partner offsite in early February. Remember, this is as the zeitgeist, the uprising, bonuses are falling on Wall Street, a worry that you are uh, taking from Peter to pay Paul. This idea here that they're about to have the second best year by revenue ever, but the consumer business has lost $4 billion since 2020. So wait a minute. This is important. Are you aware of this, Lisa, that their business is great except the bank? So an industrial banker at Goldman Sachs has to have less bonus? Listen, is that true? I think you have to think about this in two ways. This is really important. One is what does the new consumer business look like under David Solomon? Clearly, the ambitions have been pared back. There are very big business lines that are not going to see the day of light, like checking, for example, which they were going to invest heavily in. But I will also say this, Goldman will keep who they want to keep. And guess what? They have something on their side here. The engineers that would go to Meta just a couple of months ago are probably not doing that. They're not running to crypto because firms are falling apart. Yeah, we just did that with Katie. Well, I wonder how much this is also lip service and a political statement as well, and how much the banks are going to try to get ahead of a recession next year by saying we're going to cut bonuses, we're going to trim, we're going to be humble at a time when they're still making quite a bit of money. If you take a look at some of the income, particularly with interest income, how much is that a real messaging angle behind some of the shrunken bonus pools? And it's interesting, too. Goldman has uh, been holding up in the stock market more recently. Again, they have been doing well by revenue. But you also have them trailing from a price-to-book perspective from rivals like Morgan Stanley that have made big, big, big strategic decisions early on. You saw them do two of the biggest deals since the financial crisis in the heat of the pandemic, essentially, at low valuations. And the question is, is David Solomon going to do something transformative for Goldman Sachs? 
This is coming into a period of some distress, and there's concern about what these banks do with loans on their books, <laughs> Twitter, or things of that nature that they will have <clears throat> to sell to the market next year. How much is that a concern, and how much has that been overplayed at a time when risk control has been at the forefront of every bank's minds? It's not overplayed. It's not overplayed at all, and you have two things. First of all, Goldman can do their victory lap about missing that loan, right? They advise on the Twitter side. Morgan Stanley is the one to watch when it comes to Twitter in itself. Remember, they were punching so hard into the leveraged loan market. <clears throat> Does that position them not to fight as hard in leveraged loans once they come back? There's also this worry that, hey, listen, big banks are shedding customers. Yeah. Why are they losing millions of dollars in leveraged loans? Could Twitter be owned by Morgan Stanley? <laughs> I mean, you have to think about, I mean, you're talking about the prospect of bankruptcy. That is a very scary thought th th for the lenders here. Remember, I would say that there's a whole other side of this where the buy right. side is waiting for things to get bad enough to buy things on the cheap, right. so it may never get to that point. I, I want to go to your reporting and Srinath Jaraj's reporting and, frankly, everything else on the street and, and redo what you said four minutes ago. A banker, a trader at Goldman is going to see a reduced bonus because of the consumer bank challenges at Goldman Sachs? Is that what you said? On the record, on television with us, about two weeks ago, David Solomon told us that firm-wide performance is what they're going to pay off of. Pay gonna, he, he's under the delusion that he's going to pay traders and whatever off of an aggregate performance of Goldman Sachs. I think the interesting flip side to that is he said that the talent war is still sticky. So listen, like I said, they're going to fight for right. the people they want to fight Is Mr. For. Gorman, and let's say Mr. Gorman has a little slowness in asset management or whatever, Eaton Vance came in, whatever the song and dance is, is he doing the same thing, applying an aggregate performance or slow down over to high performing bonuses and those people won't get paid at Morgan Stanley. Listen, you have the FT reporting at the investment bank alone at Goldman Sachs, bonuses could fall by 40%. Listen, Goldman's margin Did their business fall by 40%? <laughs> Goldman Sachs currently today is leading mergers and acquisitions lead tables against its peers by almost 10 percentage points. 10. So, I mean, the thing is for them to cut bonuses by 40%, I it's leverage. I, I, I'm Where amateur are these here. bankers going to go? I, I, I defer, is what I want. I defer know. to you or Paul Sweeney or that. Lisa, I've never heard this. I've never heard you can take derivatives traders in the sweat and tumble. You know, and it's cue also them off leverage, an right? It's exactly. This is pencil sharpening. The numbers are not set in stone right now. If you say 40, everyone else goes 40. Okay. So it's. it's no. And honestly, I also view this as. The big next wave of layoffs will be in the middle sectors, yeah. where that will be some of the uh, curtailment. And if you look at how much the staff has been expanded, there are many areas you can cut while still rewarding the people you want to keep. And that's going to possibly oh, be the on. story around not only Wall Street, but just, but just but globally. But aren't they laying off old-style people and hiring digital animals, computer animals? You know what's animals? interesting about that? that right? Even with a 4,000-person headcount reduction at Goldman, that still probably brings you to levels above where they started. Started the year, so four thousand. Started two thousand twenty-two. Correct. Really? Yes. 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 They've expanded like by what thirty-eight percent or something since that two thousand nine. Yeah, so it's painful. Absolutely, it's painful. But if you think about how much they've grown, it's really a drop in the bucket. I would say also remember this competition even from the buy side. Even if you see big multi-strat firms like Citadel hiring here, you do see so many hedge fund firms, the big talent takers, the Tiger Globals, bleeding. Right. Uh, and so even the macro funds that have come back, they're they coming back go? after a bad year of performance last year. So the talent war here is not as intense as you would think at this time, because there's just not the money. Do you to go predict around. people will leave? One final question. Do you believe people will leave these banks because they're 40 percent off in bonus? Uh, they will. They always do. But again, Goldman will probably okay. pay for the people they want to keep and well, others will be zeroed <clears> out. There's your brief of the day from Sonali Basak, and she'll have that out on digital, I'm sure, here in a bit. Very important for Global Wall Street. The challenges of a difficult uh, bonus season, uh, to, say, to say the least. Futures up five, down futures up 64. Important economic data coming up today. It is a Friday dump of economic data. Lisa Abramo is focused on PCE deflator. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
this is the most expected, most anticipated recession right. ever. To be historically unique, to not go into recession. We do have the unemployment rate rising. Um, you know, that is enough of a, you know, it's a high enough rate to cause a, a mild recession. And you'll see a recovery before, before you get out of the recession. Our baseline is that the U.S. economy will avoid recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on a Friday, an exceptionally busy economic day. It is not the sleepy uh, Friday before a wonderful holiday, a wonderful final week of the year. This is an important day of important economic data. Futures up six, Dow futures up 74. Uh, Farrow on assignment. He's, uh, there was a sighting south of Exeter on his way to Cornwall. Heavy rains uh, in southwestern uh, England. But Lisa, this data today, and you focus on what Jerome Powell focused focuses on, which may be quiescent PCE deflator. Personal consumption and expenditures, how much do people end up continuing to fuel a core inflation that the Fed is concerned about? <clears throat> how does the market respond to that? If you get a bigger than okay. expected pop or you don't have as big of a decline in that core PCE figure, do you see stocks completely sell off, fall out of bed? Do you see bonds, uh, you know, yields rip higher, uh, price down? Or do you see a immediate well, response as everybody kind of waits for the holiday? Let's look back 48 hours and looked at gloomy data two days ago, but yet corporate data good, Nike, uh, uh, FedEx, the market went up, gazoom, boom, up we went. And then yesterday we had good economic data and we cratered because Chairman Powell is going to raise rates up to 9% or something. This is the year that won't die. I mean, everybody just wants it to end. Yeah, that and it's describes like, March of this year. No, but truly, there's this feeling of going on and on with respect <clears throat> to all of the data and the twists and the turns. And I do think that China, Japan, ending the year with a real bang, creating a lot of instability with some of the projections going out and just overnight uh, uh, yeah. percolating more on that front. Not that I remember 73 clear as a bell. Good morning, Genesee Cremail. But... Uh, you know, I remember 73 rolled over into an uglier 74 before the nirvana of 75 up onto the great bull market of 1982. No one's really talking about an extension of this news flow, this war in Ukraine, these markets, the end of the pandemic dynamics in the next year. It's supposed to be all over now, and I don't, I just don't see that. Well, it feels a little bit like people are throwing darts at a dartboard. If you read all of the projections, they're like, why do we have to write yeah. year-end projections heading into next year? Because we have no clue. But the parameters of <clears> gloom <throat> at the well, first half and optimism in the second half seems to be prevailing as we head into a new year. We've got a wonderful guest coming up here in moments who uh, threw the dartboard out years ago. She's got some incredible experience through the ebbs and flows of what to do with your uh, portfolio. Program note, I do want to mention I'm honored that Bob Diamond, uh, I get really emotional about this. Bob Diamond will join us in the 8 o'clock hour on his his good friend, Scott Minard. We are thrilled that Mr. Diamond uh, will attend. Futures up 5, Dow Futures up 64. Churn to the market, but there is an anticipation to the tape, even as Lisa mentions, bonds close at 2, to all this economic data. And, yes, Michael McKee brought in on special notice. I think he slept here last night. He was carted in. I think he was, yeah, you know, exactly. the, the, you know, the, 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 McKee suit, the McKee suit that's over there on the backside of radio. Bonds, a two-year yield is what Farrell would quote, 427 up three basis points. Well, man, that's flat, excuse me. I can't quote it like Farrell, I'm sorry. 10-year yield, 3.70% uh, is of note. Oil with a lift here as well. We mentioned that uh, earlier. Currencies churning pretty much flat. Yen, 132.72, maybe some stasis uh, right now. We need a brief, particularly on what happens at 8.30. Lisa, what do you have? Well, it's the PCE core deflator. We're all watching that. Year over year, it's expected to come down to 4.6% from 5%. What is the bigger risk for markets? This is really, I think, the more interesting uh, question to ask heading into uh, 90 minutes from now. Is it that it underwhelms or overwhelms, that upside surprise or downside surprise. Right now, markets are thinly traded. Everyone's trying to get out before the storms really uh, consolidate ice around <laughs> this, the rain. This really uh, it could be a potentially uh, massively market-moving event. 10 a.m., you get University of Michigan sentiment for December as well as November, new home sales. Expect a pop in sentiment. Often this particular index reflects the gasoline prices, has an inverse relationship to them, and we have seen gasoline prices at the lowest rate 
date going back to July of 2021. Also, 2 p.m., bond markets are closing early. I have auction no today? idea. No, there's no auction. auction? <laughs> yeah. We can auction. It's like a you celebratory know. cigar. We can auction your auction. antique auction. tang cup, but we right. are curious about <clears throat> where we go next year. Right. I just want to give you some sense of where we have been. That so far, year to date, we have seen at one point in November a four percentage point increase in the two year yield. Four percentage point. Now it's about three and a half percent to four point to seven percent. And it's been a doubling and more of the 10 year yield this year. Can I give you a weather report? Rob Carroll Please. is scheduled to be with me in the nine o'clock hour. He is the best. I've been watching Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is this, and he calls it a Siberian front, comes across America. It was 81 below zero, he said, in Siberia. This morning, when I first looked at this, Pittsburgh was 40 degrees. Just in three hours, well, no, I got in, I got in at five or six, right? Yeah, okay. But Pittsburgh's already down to 23 degrees, feels like 13. Well, that's exactly that's how fast this but, is moving. But that's the reason why this is actually a really scary storm. And that's yes. why it becomes a bomb cyclone because of the there speed. And you have suddenly 60 degrees, bam, of uh, difference uh, in the temperature, which is what creates the black ice, which is what creates the winds, which is what creates some of the uh, potentially catastrophic scenarios that hopefully will not ban me <clears> from getting out of the airport. That's just my personal plea to the transportation gods. Lisa doing the weather? at like <laughs> 6 15 p.m nationwide I was, I was stranded once at jfk for almost two days with a toddler really? because a toddler? of the because of the snows so i have lived the war stories of uh airport i've never woes. enjoyed that and you and you've you, never enjoyed you, that no, i've never enjoyed <laughs> yeah. that experience and you oh, had this experience in atlanta i believe a number of months <laughs> Did ago you have to bring that up yeah we didn't get no, out we you, ended up stranded in atlanta. You were stranded all atlanta. right let's just hope things go better yeah, let's Tom? do this let's, <laughs> let's save pivot. the show with <laughs> Quincy Crosby, Chief Global Strategist at LPL Financial. This is a really important position. Quincy has to look at the bigger, broader view for representatives handling real money for scared people. Quincy, how does your outlook for next year change after bonds priced down this year, equities priced down this year? How do you write an outlook forward after what we've seen? You know, it sounds like Lisa talking about the weather uh, over the next uh, couple of days. <laughs> you know, you go through these stages and it's the most talked about, you know, weather bomb uh, that we, we've had all year. So, you you know, we're looking at the re recession. You, starting on a trading floor, we always learn you trade and invest in the markets you have, not the one you want. And so we, we come up with a number of scenarios and we try to build guardrails around it. So in our report, we have three different scenarios because we know that it's going to change. The data will change. The Fed will change. Chairman Powell tends to go into different monetary um, lanes when he speaks. That will change too. But overall, what we want to do is make sure that the clients get out at the end of next year right. as as best they can. And and, and that's, that's the issue. And we're lucky this year. Right. I mean, there is some luck that the bond market is actually helping. You're not you're not wedded to equities if you don't want to be. If you want right. to be very conservative, you've heard this over and over again all week that two year, go down short uh, duration in treasuries, investment grade short duration get a little bit more. Right, right, How right. great is that? Well, Lisa, what's right. important yeah. on this is Quincy uh, really pushes against the gloom that's out there. It's a very measured approach versus some of the you know, massive gloom reports we're seeing. Well, and a lot of people are agreeing with that. Quincy, we just saw the biggest weekly outflow ever from stock funds. We saw $42 billion withdrawn. Why didn't that have a more material effect on valuations? Why are we seeing some of these massive outflows without the ramifications in price that we might expect? Because I think we have to wait for the earnings. The, you know, the last couple of quarters, we went in with a gloomy, gloomy forecast margins were going to be pressured. We came out and it was, it was granted, granted, we lower the expectations, the bar becomes lower. But nonetheless, there were enough positive surprises to leave the quarters and say, you know, it wasn't that bad. It really wasn't that bad. And that's the issue. We're going into fourth quarter earnings, in, obviously, in a couple of weeks. The question is, do we start to see the pressure th there? And that's why guidance becomes so terribly important. Then we have to wait for the first quarter. We have to wait to see what the companies are saying. When all is said and done, this is about 
what companies are doing. We tend to forget that because we're listening to people on, you know, in the media. Oh my goodness, it's it's it's, it's going to be the a recession, a deep recession, modest recession. We do not know yet. We take all of the data we have now, and what we're saying is. It could be a stall speed. It could be an earnings recession yeah. and just a milder recession. That's well, it. We've Quincy, got to get, yeah. Can you yeah. come on the first day of 2023? I mean, I just, I just, I'm sorry. You know where I am on this, Quincy. I just, you, you know, yeah. I mean, you haven't lived what I've lived, but the answer is, Quincy, I, I mean, the level of gloom right now, you can cut with a knife. What are LPL clients doing quickly here? What are you seeing at LPL from your clients? Are they all in the triple leverage all cash fund? No, they've had, they hung in there. One of the things that was most important for the retail advisor was, tell me this is not 2007 and 2008 all over again. Please tell me that is not what we're seeing. And we've gone over all of the data with them. This is not 2007, 2008. The Fed right. has a mandate. This is the mandate. It's congressionally mandated. Price stability. And that's what to do. It isn't, it isn't a great process. But it isn't like 1981, 82, 79, 80, Paul Volcker's year. No, it is not. And so we're going to get there, but it may not be fun. There's zigs and zags. Right. But one thing they learned, don't start selling because you know what? There we go. There are just, okay. That's the key. Okay, we got to go, Quincy. Thank you so much. Quincy Crosby yeah. there uh, with the courage to be in the market. Lisa, I mentioned this to St. Martin Adams the other day. Gina Martin Adams, this is the legend of St. Martin Adams. It's like, it's like Dr. Crosby. You have to be in the market to play. That's Martin Adams 101. Which market? And that's what I would argue. Oh, there we go. We, no, you know. I think this is an important question because yes, we've just seen this sector? huge tailwind of interest rates going down for right. decades. We've speaking, had, you know, this is this is a serious question. Speaking of tailwinds in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, good are morning. You trolling me? Let's Freezing stop on the lawn at Carnegie Mellon, 23 degrees, 21 degrees, whatever. 23 degrees to minus two below zero in the next four hours. If I don't wow. make it out. I'm blaming you, Tom. You there just keep are. with the weather reports. Pittsburgh. Talk about airports. <laughs> airports like on this plateau, and it's like the wind never stops. It's actually sport to land there. Anyways, good morning, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Stay warm out there. Coming up at 8 o'clock on Mr. Minard, Bob Diamond, thrilled that he will attend. Futures up five. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. North Korea fired two suspected short-range ballistic missiles today in an area near Pyongyang's main international airport. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is finding space to ramp up provocations against the U.S. and its allies as President Biden focuses on Russia's war in Ukraine. The launch comes three days after the U.S. sent a bomber and F-22 stealth fighters to the peninsula for joint drills with South Korea. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the U.S. is committed to stand with the government in Kyiv for as long as it takes. Blinken says work is continuing to repair and defend Ukraine's energy infrastructure and bolster its air defenses, including with Patriot missiles. He discussed the war today in a call with his Chinese counterpart. Thai Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha says he'll seek to retain his position with the help of new party and a vote expected in the first half of 2023. The premier is splitting back from the military back party that helped him stay in power following a 2019 election. A recent court ruling barred him from holding office beyond April 2025, even if he stays prime minister. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. My goal and my wish is that the, the members that our new leadership in the House, based on the foundation that we have laid, or forming their own approach, will do even better than the significant legislative successes that I have had as Speaker of the House.
the Speaker of the House, whatever your politics, Nancy Pelosi has been a public service. Of course, the family drama of the recent months is well weighing on her, and she looks forward to a different Washington for her in the coming months and years. We welcome all of you, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene. There was a John Farrow sighting. Uh, good to see he is safe in his United Kingdom. It's not it's sport today at Heathrow. Not funny. Yeah. The, they're, they're, I think, instituting actual what we call customs agents, I believe, on strike or slowdown, one of the two. It's a strike that's going to last eight days <clears throat> uh, and is beginning yeah. today, one of the busiest right. travel days of the year, which, you know, it's going to clog up yeah. a lot and it's going to cost even more of a yeah. haul over an already sleepy yeah. city of London. One of my worst experiences ever, one of the worst lines I've ever been in, it was at Heathrow. I'm standing there being a tourist and I look over next to me and he looks at me and I look to him. And we're in line for an hour, me and Mario Gabelli. So I figure I can figure out what to do with a triple leverage dog cash fund. And I, I'm, a, 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 you know, the greatest value investor on the planet. And I want to talk to him about industrial companies and the next Cadbury shops. All he did the entire time was talk about the New York Yankees. I mean, it was like torture. Oh, it was that like was torture, torture for you? I'm going to bring this like up some absolute, other time. <laughs> absolute torture. Mario Gabelli at Heathrow talking uh, the New York uh, Yankees. Futures up 7, Dow Futures up 75. You need to stay with us in an hour and 15 minutes. A ton of economic data that will move markets as in the last two days. This is a joy to talk about something that I am remiss to talk about. I'm, I'm greatly at fault on this, yet furious. Edward Mills is with us. He is with Raymond James with legit decades on Wall Street. Now, Ed Mills, folks, doesn't go back to the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. I do. And Ed, I'm just going to state on, without any hesitation, it's a failure. The people that chronicle this are at your Boston College. They have the best analysis in the country. Let's begin before the legislation that's just occurred. How big a mess is our retirement plan system? Well, there's a lot right in our retirement plan system, but there's a lot more we can get done better. Um, and so in this omnibus bill, and I think this is what you're teeing up, is we have some of the biggest changes in a couple of decades to retirements uh, included in this bill. Uh, the, the RMD, the required minimum distribution age, is going up ultimately to 75. We're going to have more businesses that are required to have automatic enrollment mm -hmm. and required matching for 401k programs. Um, and one thing we did during COVID is if there is a significant life event for someone where they need to use some of their 401k plan money, they can have withdrawals without penalty if there are certain life events, right. natural disaster, health. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like we are going to shore up the retirement system. This is something that is right. good um, for, for retirees. And clarify here what I consider a sophomoric debate, that this bill only benefits the wealthy, the government gets paid the taxes eventually, right? I mean, if somebody's got a gajillion dollars in their 401k, Lisa's way ahead of me on that. And at some point, the government gets a tax revenue, right? It's true. And what I would focus on there, Tom, is that there is a couple of provisions. We've seen news um, in, in surveys over the last several years about how if there was a $1,000 expense, that a majority of Americans can't actually come up with that money. There are emergency fund uh, set-asides that will be set up within employee programs as well. For low-income individuals, there's going to be a match from the federal government up to $1,000 for contributions to the 401k. Oftentimes, that came as a tax credit, but it's going to go directly into Wonder, the account I did not know that. of Wonderful. those individuals. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of low-income <clears throat> Um, provisions right. here that help out right. the very people who usually and, don't get the benefit of the retirement and, and, and system. And Ed Mills will be interested in this. Lisa, I was at a Democratic uh, Party convention with the senator from Maryland, Mr. Summer, a wonderful guy, and he and Oxley were trying to salvage this, this disastrous 74 act, which was just partially done. It was, it, we all knew five years in it was a disaster. And Senator Sarbanes was physically shaking as he and I were talking about what needed to be done. And only now 
are we beginning to address some of this? And part of it is because it's always wrapped in politics, and <clears throat> this is no different, especially as Democrats really wanted to get it through before the end of the year, before they lost some of their majority, certainly in the House. Where were the wins for the Democrats, and where is the pushback from the Republicans in this final edition? Yeah, Lisa, I mean, there are huge changes kind of, you know, this is a $1.7 trillion bill. Uh, it's a 9% increase in the defense budget. I think that's a shock uh, compared to where people expected the Biden administration to be on defense spending. It's a 5% increase on domestic spending. Uh, they have enough a number of policy provisions on health care. Uh, there is a, a number of wins. Uh, related to tax policy. I think one thing that is under the radar that I'm watching that is important for the inflation conversation is that through COVID, 18 million Americans have added to the roles of Medicaid. About 12 to 15 million of them probably are no longer eligible. Their eligibility is going to come off next year. What does that do for labor force participation? What does that do to health care expenses? Uh, there's big macro impacts of this uh, funding bill. Which is something that also brings up the Social Security increase, the 8 percent raise that people have been talking about, the cost of living adjustment that uh, the Congress made. There have been a number of steps that some people point to as potentially inflationary. People coming back into the labor force perhaps is the opposite, right? It goes into balancing out the labor market in a more seamless way. Do you see this omnibus bill as having a more inflationary kind of result or a neutral or de disinflationary? I, I'd say, Lisa, this is a um, probably having a disinflation impact. Um, the 5% increase or the 9% increase, those sound like big numbers. Uh, but what Republicans will highlight is that that 5% increase on domestic spending is less than the rate of inflation. And that big change to Medicaid, you know, getting 12 million people redetermined where they might no longer have that, um, will right. kind of change the kind of uh, <clears throat> calculation for a lot of individuals and change their discretionary income. Uh, it's something that no one is talking about just yet. Ed Mills, thank you so much. Wonderful brief. There. I learned a lot there. We'll have to get you back on here as this uh, unfolds across January as well. He is with Raymond James on seriously changed legislation that affects all of us in our uh, retirement. Surveillance, I mean, come on, they're listening in London. Uh, there's the headline, Chart Banner. Thank you so much for this. Lisa, United Kingdom Heathrow workers accept pay offer call off strike that according to Bloomberg News and Unite uh, as, as well. And I guess that's uh, what happens when, you know, you, you wonder here about the social aspect, because I know I, I'll say the Telegraph, but I think it was in all the British papers where the railroad strike leadership was starting to vacillate because of the fury of the British public over massive inconvenience. Well, I'm looking right now at American <clears throat> Airlines shares, which are up about six tenths of a percent. So I don't know. I wonder how much this is actually going to fuel a bit more optimism after a real fuel, feeling of right. any time yeah. I'm here for you all, right. all morning. I'll be here trying to come up with those puns as it's I try great. to uh, avoid my own morass of travel experience. But I am it's curious about how much this is going to be. <laughs> this is going to be uh, important. Uh, also, though, there, uh, these are these are widespread strikes, whether they go beyond Heathrow workers and go go beyond yeah. the other air, airports, the other yeah. trains, the other infrastructure <clears throat> in the United and Kingdom what, remains to be seen. In America, what's interesting here is we have a grizzled veteran of this as Secretary of Labor, the former mayor of Boston, Martin Walsh. That headline about Heathrow is exactly what Marty Walsh has lived for decades. And what you get he it just fixed. tried to avoid with yeah. what they did with, yeah. uh, with the shipping yards over in Los Angeles. Features of Bay coming up. Must listen. Bramo with an equity overview. Good morning. everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. We welcome all of you across a frozen America. I guess L.A. is warm, warm, warm in Miami uh, as well, the way this uh, Siberian front, what'd you call it, a bomb cyclone? Yeah, is it's that, a bomb cyclone. Because it, it, of the That's wind. It's the technical, it's the it's speed, wind. it's the, uh, <clears throat> just the acceleration of the temperature changing. The millibar, the pressure drops, like yeah, so yeah. maybe it's, it's like, it's a, like winter a bomb hurricane. of pressure bomb. coming down. Very good. That's your weather report for this morning, Bramo. We've been doing it all morning. It there. It's like <laughs> yeah, try. A bomb. Get I'm down. watching Pittsburgh. Good morning, Pittsburgh, from 40 degrees 
to now 20 to zero. That's in about two hours. It is amazing that that wall of cold and I'm tracking it in Pittsburgh, but you can track it where you are as well. Rob Carolyn will be with me on radio, I hope, in the nine o'clock hour. Um, as, as as we move forward. Futures up 9, Dow futures up 80. Note last night, 8.59 p.m., just before the surveillance bedtime, Bramo emailing me, we need to talk to somebody about what matters. So we're going to do that now. Jason Trennett went out years ago at Strategus, a bird company, and hired one of the best spread guys on the street. His name is Thomas Storis, and his notes are... Are, are really, really something. We're going to get to that in a moment, but first we've got to do equity. Can you top Nike FedEx today, or no. are you just sort of sliding through it on a Friday? I, I'll try. We're going to start on the story that keeps on giving or keeps on taking away, depending on what side of the trade you're on. Tesla shares uh, are uh, really little change this morning, even as Elon Musk says he'll stop yeah. selling those shares. They're up about 1.5% well, now so after it. seeing a, a pretty big decline throughout the year. He basically is saying he won't sell stock until probably two years from now, definitely not next year, under any circumstances. He said this kind of thing before. He was speaking right. in a Twitter Spaces uh, kind of concept. We heard from Dan Ives on Twitter, actually, about this, saying that this could put the lows in for the stock if it actually is uh, the issue that he we see with the Elon Musk. He the price target yeah. down, I think, to 175. Some more than where it's at right now. Still, he's enthusiastic, and I thought you, Lisa, given a menu of to-dos for Mr. Musk. It's not like fixed sales in China. It's this is it's it's not a normal reaffirmed outperform from Mr. Ives. It's basically stop with the politics, <clears throat> stop with the drama over at Twitter, and then, oh, yeah, you have to deal with uh, waning demand. I'm also looking at AMC. Uh, interesting to see those shares plunging at 9 percent in pre-market trading after they did a 10 to 1 reverse stock split with uh, <clears throat> converting preferred equity units into common shares. The CEO on Twitter said the changes would stop investors from pushing AMC toward penny stock territory not being received really? well currently. And then I was looking also at CarMax because it ended the day down almost 4 percent yesterday and the losses are continuing today. And they dragged down a lot of the used car auto dealers as well as beyond. Those shares down 1 percent ahead of the yeah, open. Well. Really interesting area, particularly with its macroeconomic read in terms of demand and who can buy and who cannot buy you, with you, the rates of where they are. You educated me on this yesterday. I mean, I, or the day before, whatever it was, Carvana, CarMax, and you, the, the summary here is America can't afford new cars. Right. Well, no, America can afford new cars because those typically are higher cost <clears throat> luxury cars that people with money can afford and they can afford. To That's pay not with America, cash. though. A lot of America rest, can't do that. The rest yeah. of America yeah. is struggling with 11 percent interest rates to borrow a loan or higher, to buy a car would, yeah, would... and and costs that have gone up so much over the past couple of yeah. years. It's been some some people would say a bubble in the used car space. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. So what we're going to do here is really digress here. This is so detailed and so narrow. I, I really can't talk to Tom. I mean, it's all there is to it. He's head of fixed income research at Strategus, a Strategus, a Baird company. And, and Lisa, this is your world. And his call on spreads to me is shocking. Explain first what he's saying. Translated. Well, what he's saying is what a lot of people have been saying, but I'll let you put it uh, in your words better than I, that we could see rates already have plateaued and come down, but the credit aspect is at risk next year, that people are going to demand more because of the downturn and the potential economic cycle. How deep will that credit-related pain be from your vantage point? Yeah, well, it, really, the truth is we're looking at a very shallow recession and very shallow credit contraction in 2023. Now, the depth of that will be determined in part by how high the Fed funds rate goes and how long it takes to get to recession. The longer it takes to get to recession, therefore, the more consumers build up credit card debt and the more the Fed raises the Fed funds rate, the deeper the recession is going to be and the wider the credit spreads are going to be. But right now, we're looking at a fairly shallow recession and credit spreads really only migrating uh, a few handles higher, so maybe about 200 basis points on IG credit. How much do you see private credit factoring into this. We saw that market expand massively over the past decade, particularly in the past five years. There hasn't necessarily been a full repricing. There haven't necessarily been the forced sales. Do you see a sort of bomb cyclone in the credit kind of uh, oh, nice. situation yeah, next good. year as you do start to have people mark to market a little bit more? 
It's very difficult to say because the truth is we don't know the two, the two big question marks is really uh, how large is that market? We really don't have a good idea. And the other question mark is you don't really get in trouble and have a catastrophic collapsing credit when borrowers are highly leveraged. You get in trouble when the creditors are highly levered. And unfortunately, we don't know how highly levered the creditors are. It's not like with banks, even when banks had off balance sheet risk, there was some good notion of how much leverage the banks had, that their, i.e. the creditors, how much leverage they had. We really don't know how much leverage the creditors have today, and we don't know the size of their books in truth. The best guess we have is when we look at the bank loan market, and the bank loan market tells us that there is some elevated risk there versus even what we saw in 2008, and that sector should underperform the high yield bond market, that is bank loans. And so we have to suspect that there is going to be an elevated amount of credit stress in private debt this cycle as well, but probably not something that is going to elevate to the point of any sort of systemic risk. So if we had to put this into hard numbers, typically the high yield bond market in a recession might see high yield spreads widen out to 700 basis points or higher, and in really distressed right. times, 1,000 basis points. Bank loans would not move that far. Bank loans would see less stress. This time around, bank loans are very likely to see more stress in the high yield bond market. And so right. more of that pain is likely to shift to bank loans and to private credit and high yield. One of the reasons why we have a fairly benign outlook on high yield credit is because we do think a lot of that stress is shifting to off to, to the kind of the private credit market in the bank loan space. It's a time you're the only guy, well, they're not the only guy, but there's like seven people in my universe that actually know what the Standard & Poor's blue bond book is. We used to sit at our desk and, you know, do this and, and go through and look at the S&P bond book like we looked at value line for equity stocks. I follow a blue chip company, doesn't matter what the name is, and they were priced premium with a big coupon. They've gone from 130 down to 70. And if you have your spread widening that you're predicting, is that quality investment grade bond going to go from 70 down to 60 or dare I say 50? Well, down to 60, very likely if we're talking about another 50 basis points of spread widening and let's just assume something on the order of a 10 year duration, then you're still talking about a fairly substantial amount of, of yeah. loss. We'll call it 5% loss. So down to a 60, uh, absolutely, that's within range here. Um, and I do think that's a type of, of, of um, be price behavior we're going to see in investment grade credit in 2023. We're very likely to see further spread widening, something on the order of 50 to 70 basis points on average. But you have to also right. recognize that that's going to be with lower all-in yields. So all-in yields are going to be coming down. So much of that spread widening is going to be offset by lower yields. This is in English. You know, this drives me nuts, Lisa, and I do this all the time. I take it back to an individual bond. I learned this from the late, great Pim Fox. He had the Standard & Poor's bond book that his father had on his desk or his grandma. I can't remember. But the bottom line is the financial media does mumbo-jumbo spreads and all this, and Soros is one of these guys that can take it down to the individual bond piece. How about you have a bond at 130 and you're enjoying it this morning, it's 70. That's called a loss. And he's saying you're going to get a greater loss. Well, in certain components, right? I mean, I guess components. the Components, I'm could talking answer... about somebody sitting on their couch. Okay. You know, well, some small hitter sitting on their couch on Fifth Avenue who owns 45 bonds and they're looking at the individual price and they're going, really? So there are two components of bonds. There's the one that's linked to interest rates and there's one that's linked to credit risk. And we're looking at the one that's linked to interest rates coming down next year. That's what a lot of people think. And the one that's linked to credit risk going up. Up means down in price and down in yield means up in price. So do these things offset themselves, Tom? Do they offset each other and leave you with a positive return in investment grade and high yield by the end of next year? In the investment grade space, I do think they're going to largely offset. And so 2022 was the year of inflation and yields moved higher. And there was really no way to hide from that. There was no way to offset that. Even if spreads had stayed tight, you were not going to offset that. 2023 is very likely going to be the year of recession. And in a shallow recession, you don't see a lot of spread widening and therefore price decline in investment grade credit. And if that is offset, which we do believe it will be with lower all in yields, then for the most part, you should be looking at positive returns in investment grade credit. High yield is going to be a potentially different story because it's going to depend an awful lot on the types of credits, the industries, 
management because in high yield you're always four quarters away from defaults and default and you have to consider will some of these names make it out of the recession alive so high yield could see negative returns right. next year but we do expect to see positive returns in investment grade credit in 2023 tom thank you so much just a terrific briefing learned a lot there tom stores with us with a uh, strategist they are a bared uh, a company lisa i really learned a lot there but i do take issue that there's just so much Frank Fabozzi relative fancy pants. And I love Greg Peters the other day because he went to, you know, price down, yield up is a reality of this year. And with the, the strategist spread widening we're talking about, what do bonds do next year if the spread widens out? I just, and, you know, I don't think credit to the rescue. Well, I just don't see it. It depends where in credit. It, it's sort of the, the difference between credit and government bonds, right? I mean, I think that that's going to be a major differential next year, especially in some of the riskier credit sectors. There's a bigger idea here, which is that bonds have been a ballast until this year. And this year, you tore up the book. And people who are sitting on those losses, <clears throat> as you've pointed out okay. throughout the year rightly, what do they do I'm... with those losses? Do they consolidate them by selling or do they pile more in? And that's the psychological aspect we do not understand fully yet. If I'm a yield hog, and I'm owning this piece I'm looking at on the Bloomberg screen. YC, folks, is how Bloomberg was invented. It's a great screen. And it, I'm down 37% in price on a price. You know, it's, it's like my Austrian piece. Oh, yeah, Look how well that great. worked out. My 98-year <laughs> Austrian piece. Yeah. <clears throat> it's fantastic. I, I, just, I just think we need to be simpler about our bond analysis. I know you don't agree. I'm just arguing with you because Farrell's not here to argue with. <laughs> well, great. I'm, so, thank you for registering your complaint. Thank you. The complaint box will be open all afternoon. Darwin Kung will be with us. He's wonderful on commodities. Stay warm out there. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, nearly 37 million people may have been infected with COVID-19 on a single day. According to the government's top health authority, some 248 million people, or 18 percent of the population, likely contracted the virus in the first 20 days of December, according to China's National Health Commission. China's dismantling of COVID-0 restrictions has unleashed the virus, making its outbreak the world's largest. Ambulance workers announced two more days of strikes in January, escalating industrial action in a bid to pressure the UK government to discuss their demand for higher pay. The new strikes by members of the Unison Union are set for January 11th and 23rd and involve more ambulance employees, not just the emergency response crews who walked out Wednesday. Nurses in the National Health Service have also walked out this month. Well, a massive winter storm hitting a huge portion of the central U.S. Thousands of flights are canceled. The National Weather Service says more than 200 million people, that's around 60 percent of the nation's population, are under some form of winter weather warning or advisory, wrecking havoc on America's travel plans just ahead of Christmas. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. China is going to have a pretty big bounce in consumption activity over the next few months. And that's going to be a big impact on commodity markets. It's going to be a big impact on certainly growth in the region. And that has implications for everything. Jens Nordvig, a really informative view there on the Atlantic dynamics and particularly his true expertise on the uh, euro as well. But they're in China, and that seems to be a theme with the news flow, folks, to be honest here. And I think Lisa's been really good at trying to keep me back on the China message. But China is a domineering story away from the weather away from what's going on in Washington and that. And it's not just COVID. It's just, it's just about the, the basic recovery. And Lisa, I don't hear anybody talking about the path of the recovery. There's no, genuinely, there's no certitude of return to 5% because there's no real 
belief or knowledge to pin that off of. There was a great story that I was reading this morning about the change in language from before <clears throat> they ripped the Band-Aid off to after, before they were calling COVID the devil virus, and now they say it's no worse than a flu. They talk about warning about all sorts of uh, transportation problems <clears throat> and asympto asymptomatic people being dangerous, and now it's okay. If you're not that sick, you're good. Don't worry about it. How much does this <laughs> pass around the virus quickly <clears throat> enough to get herd immunity fast enough to move the country forward? We're touch on China here, but also on commodities. Futures up seven right now. Big economic data coming up in less than one hour. Uh, this is really important. He's hugely qualified. He has one of the most prestigious technical pairings of degrees in America, the University of Washington, double E, along with Carnegie Mellon. Darwin Kung joins us right now, head of commodities for all of DWS and truly focused on the Pacific Rim. Darwin, instead of me guessing, give us your singular insight on Pacific Rim recovery next year? We anticipate a very strong recovery, especially from the Chinese demand for commodities. <clears throat> and I would differentiate that from other type of goods, uh, because China, uh, by far, we believe that the fiscal support required to get to their uh, GDP growth goal will be significant. And the number one spending uh, we believe out of that will be uh, right. infrastructure spending. Right and support for local governments to build out more properties and recover right. recovery in the property market as well. Darway, let's look at let's look at this from an engineering aspect and look at somewhat the calculus. You used to drive across the Wheatstone Bridge in Washington to, you know, your studies in double E. And the basic idea is there's a slew rate, which is the speed of movement. Is China, and by that matter, the rest of the Pacific Rim dynamic enough that we underestimate the speed of change that gets them back to normal. That's a very good point. And I do believe right now the market is still being very overshadowed by the slowdown we anticipate to see ex-China and developed markets in particular, both U.S. and Europe. Uh, but Chinese spending can make a significant difference. And for commodities in particular, uh, China has always been the largest uh, marginal buyer across all commodities. So the fact that we anticipate stronger uh, infrastructure spending can make a significant difference in terms of growth rate for commodity demand out of China. There's across base metals, across energy. Um, and if economy does grow as fast as government predicts, uh, we anticipate even agriculture uh, spending will go up in a significant way as well for China. I don't envy you, Darway. This has been one of the most difficult years to call crude prices, and certainly we have seen that reflected in the volatility so far. We had expected oil prices to surge to $150 on the heels of the Ukrainian conflict. We were expected oil prices to surge on a potential China reopening. Neither has happened. How? How can you explain this? Uh, so we see that oil very much is driven by near-term supply demand for price. So the balance between supply and demand is the most important part for oil price. The fact that OPEC plus Russia has proactively cut uh, supply and tried to manage the inventory level, we think is very encouraging uh, for oil price going forward for next year. Uh, at the same time, even, uh, even with the... Uh, even with the U.S. SPR release, at some point, and we think that's already started uh, right now, U.S. government does have to buy back the, the inventory for SPR, and that's additional deferred demand uh, into this year that we believe will help with supporting oil price. So we do see a floor. Into the second year, IEA most recent release of their forecast for demand in 2000. 23 uh, shows an exit rate of 104 million barrels per day. That's an increase from the previous um, estimate, uh, largely from improved China expectation. Uh, we believe that that's actually going to really help with uh, demand. The question now will be, can the producing countries, can U.S. keep up with that production towards the end of the year? So what's your view? What's your call? Uh, our platform is calling for 100 hour uh, per barrel for Brent by the end of 2023.
I, I looked our way at the great commodity cycle. This was percolating, I'm going to say, eight months ago. And, of course, we've had this massive commodity deflation, and there's people out there saying, finally, a swing in commodities, whether it's industrial metals, this, that, or the other thing. Are you investing for next year, assuming a return to a, a commodity price vector up? Is, is that a core belief? Uh, it is. Um, and we believe that's largely driven by uh, very careful spending from the natural resources producers, unlike previous cycle. Even though we've seen very low rates and incentive for companies to leverage, what we actually have seen for the natural resources companies, mining companies, oil companies, um, have been going the other way, really focused on payout on the cash flow, free cash flow, and really being uh, very diligent on capital spending and not increase uh, production capacity in any significant way. That continues to be the case, and the companies still compete to be the best payout company for from a dividend or cash, uh, share buyback perspective. So the cash flow part really drives the longer-term behavior as well. It will take a long time uh, for any natural resources company to get yeah. uh, capacity increase. And then we see that... Uh, continue to propagate into 2023 and 24. We're talking about crude, but also natural gas, and arguably that might be the more dramatic asset class next year, especially with China coming back online and competing with Europe a bit more. Certainly demand should be much greater from China by the end of next year. What are you looking at in terms of the swing upward in price for natural gas and the potential issue for Europe come winter 2023? That's much more difficult to call. The volatility for natural gas price has been dramatic. Um, but we do anticipate, and it's also very much weather driven. Uh, one thing I would just point out, 2022 uh, is a very different year compared to 2021. We think Europe actually has been very lucky in 2022, given that the droughts and the widespread droughts and shortage of electricity uh, from 2021 did not repeat in 2022. On top of that, China was in a contraction cycle in 2022. 23 will be opposite from a economic driver perspective from China. Uh, China has been very diligent about diversifying their uh, sources for natural gas. So the pipelines with Russia has been uh, really operating at a very, very high efficiency, very high volume. Uh, that has helped China in, in, in terms of uh, overall demand, that helps the rest of the world as well because it reduces China's need for liquid natural gas. If we were to see the same weather uh, in 23 as we did in 21, uh, I think Europe will have a much tougher time to refill their tanks. Um, for one right. thing, uh, the Russian volume will not be available to them. Now, we've got to run. Year. Darway, thank you so much. Generous of your time this morning. Darway Cohen with us with DW asked, at least I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we brought this up and that the COVID analysis, which you mentioned with Secretary Blinken's comment, completely overwhelms the economic analysis, which is the fact China's flat on its back. There's no other way to put it. And it's difficult to no, get a read on what the this shift in COVID stance will do to the economy, because right now there's stasis. People are sick. People are staying home. When does that change? And you were asking that question, and people are projecting <clears throat> that out as people try to understand the science of it, which is the critical mass of herd immunity. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's unfair to say they're doing it without vaccine. I think they've got some efficacy of vaccine, yeah, yeah. but um, I, I think there's a real mystery. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, three differential equations by true experts of immunology at Imperial College in London. Well, that's because they had the data. We don't have that data for China. We don't have the, that math. There's no way. It seems like it could be a potential factor in next year that will be big. Right. We have no gauge of it at this point. We will see. Futures up nine, down futures up 83. The yen, 132.70. We've got important economic data in 32 minutes, a full slate of economic data. Michael McKee will be with us. Coming up, Bob Diamond on his friend, Scott Minard.
this point, folks are, are looking at maybe the, not the wrong data, but inflation isn't going to be the issue in 2023. The market believes that the Fed is going to be successful in engineering a slowdown. In January, though, the market is going to have to get closer to where the Fed is. We will get you know some overall softer inflation prints in, in 2023. I think it's going to be a more modest returning year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. 30 minutes away from the last important inflation read of 2022. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. It's not Tom a Friday. King, John it's Farrow, Friday. Lisa Abramowitz. And it's not exactly the yeah. sleepy Friday before Christmas that you would expect, given that we are about to get what could be an incredibly consequential <clears throat> okay. PCE reading on the American consumer. So inflation down. The GDP was up. We've got an inflation report January 12th. And are you saying, and I think McKee would say, this is arguably more important than some of those data. It is another data point at a time of thin liquidity after a confluence of quite confusing metrics that we have gotten over the mm -hmm. past two weeks. How much do you, you potentially get some uh, disruption in markets at a time when a lot of people have already checked out? And this no. really could give a sense of how much people still are spending, the resilience of the <clears throat> U.S. consumer and how that's bleeding into the most important metric yeah. that the Fed looks at. I believe we're data dependent. Is that how we can, <laughs> yeah, what a, we but, can put that? But this yeah. is then the question. What is the bigger risk, upside or downside <clears throat> surprise? It's not just inflation going down. It's how quickly. It's where. It's the components. This is what people yeah. are going to be parsing through on a day of perhaps thin trading. I like, well, yeah, Kimmy, and you mentioned bond market closing it, too. I wasn't even aware of that. I like what Quincy Crosby said is, you know, we've been here before. We'll get through it. And I thought that was really, you know, a, a, a good way of uh, putting it. You going to do a data check here or, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can get there. I was really okay. uh, going to yeah. explain some of the other things that please, we're looking at please. today. We are the watching weather. the weather. Yeah. We are watching how that affects uh, some of the energy I'll prices. You You're going to roll your eyes. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be trying to get out, theoretically, from an airport, and let's pray for them. Um, but I do think that this could be potentially setting us up for a day of a reset, the last real day before the year of end. We started the show. Pittsburgh was 23 degrees. It's now 9 degrees above zero. Feels like minus 10. That's how fast this thing is moving. A little bit of a lift right now in the report. s and, and okay uh, NASDAQ. Fabulous. Uh, we're looking at the S&P up about a quarter of a percent. NASDAQ <clears throat> up about 3%, uh, 0.3%, excuse me. Just not exactly doing that much after the sell-off yesterday. Yields <clears throat> creeping just a touch higher. Sleepy markets across the board, but crude notably up 2.4%. How much do you start to see the fluctuations in the energy market, Tom, on the right. heels of weather patterns, really looking for cold weather to juice some of those prices. We thought we would do this this morning, and we'll turn for a moment to this death of Scott Minard. It has just been appalling uh, particular thoughts to Scarlett Fu, who was the one that brought me Scott uh, Minard. But I thought we would give you a window into Scott Minard's past, and the first thing I said is get me Bob Diamond. Bob, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Take us back before Barclays to Credit Suisse, and you had this young Turk making bond decisions. Why was Scott Minard special in the trenches of fixed income, the tumult of Europe in the late 80s, early 90s? Uh, first of all, I, I just already miss him terribly. He had the kindest uh, soul um, of anyone I've ever worked with, um, for every person he worked with. And Tom, it actually went before that to Morgan Stanley. Scott and I were in Morgan Stanley, New York. Uh, I moved to London in, in, uh, in 88 to run international fixed income trading, the trading outside the U.S. Scott was good enough to leave his unit and come and join my unit, which was pretty new at the time. And when I think back at the, at the incredible transaction we did during that period, not many people recall this, but we did the first European currency unit bond ever issued in 1992 when Scott and I were at Morgan Stanley. Um, ironically, the issuer was the Bank of England, and it was certainly a precursor to all that came following that with the single currency and the introduction of the euro in 1998. But that was just, to me, just another example of how Scott was always at the very, very forefront 
of everything going on in the fixed income markets. Scarlett Fu and our Fed coverage have always seen how he's supple, how he could change his mind. As I yeah. say, he had a train of thought like a CPA, not like some fancy CFA uh, macro baloney. But the answer is Scott Minard for you and others, including Guggenheim, had to manage risk. What was the key risk attribute that he had daily on the desk at Morgan Stanley and at Credit Suisse? Um, I, I think of a time at Credit Suisse. First of all, this, this, is a, this is a man who loved studying the markets, studying the Fed, always had a grasp on the macro environment, the medium term, the long term, and all of his shorter term actions were based on those. What a lot of people forget is the actions he took in, uh, in 1994. Scott was working for me as head of credit trading at CSFB in New York. You'll recall that was the last time we had this kind of real strong rate increase. And at that time, the victim was Orange County. Um, and I remember Scott coming into my office. We sat down with a group of traders. He was the first to recognize the problems in Orange County. By that afternoon, we had exited every position. Um, these were repo positions. All the money was returned to Orange County, and it triggered the liquidation of those repo positions across all the other dealers. And to me, it was the vision Scott had then and has always had um, his grasp of the macro and his grasp of what was right for the regulators as well as what was right for us at, at CSFB. And one of the things that goes unrecognized is the incredible execution. We're out of those positions by the afternoon of the first recognition of what was going on with the at the time, the Orange County debacle. Bob, uh, tremendous, tremendous professional. The nimbleness uh, that it takes to be able to do that, the conviction, but also what we've been talking about all year, humility to change your mind, to move on a dime. How did he embody that in a way that really uh, speaks volumes to you about what it takes to be successful in a very changing place, which is Wall Street? Um, you know, I think Right to your point, Lisa, interestingly, is his move from Morgan Stanley and CSFB where he was trading. And every night was mark to market. And most days you were turning over your inventory. His evolution into the investment management side, I think, was a critical factor for Scott. If he could be better at something than he was at taking risk in the fixed income markets, he was even better as an investor. And I think that was because he spent so much time truly studying what was going on with the Fed and the other central banks. And he had such a firm grip on policy so that all of his micro decisions were based around um, a conviction um, of what was happening in the macro environment. But he never sat on it, Lisa, just to your point. He studied it consistently day in and day out. And um, I, I don't know anyone in either the trading environment or the investment management environment that that spent as much time doing research, you know, throughout his career, even in the very, very senior position he was in more recently at Guggenheim. As we enter a new territory, a new era, as some people are calling it, where perhaps central banks are not going to be the tailwind that they were for so long, is your view that Wall Street and trading desks more generally have that spirit more broadly? Or do you think that perhaps there is a, a lack of that experience on some of the trading floors after all of the churn that we've seen in the past decades? Well, listen, there's no question that the experience of uh, people that grew up on trading desks in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s is very different than the most recent period. Since um, the financial crisis in, in 2008, it's kind of been a one-way one um, bet. Uh, I hate to use the word bet, but kind of directionally, zero interest rates, um, doing everything that was, was required. That All those efforts kind of redoubled or maybe troubled um, during COVID. Um, and it's clearly a different environment right now. So I think the, mm -hmm. um, the skills of people that are getting marked to market every day, turning their inventory every day, far more typical of the trading floors of the, of the, of the big banks and the hedge funds, our skills are right. going to be paramount going forward. Uh, Bob, you've lived this in Technicolor. Uh, and, you know, I think of this year, the challenges you've had at Atlas Merchant, uh, like a lot of other people in the equity space and the whole SPAC thing and crypto and all the rest of this. Are there young Scott Minards out there 
Or are we moving so fast in a two and 20 bonus world, immediate gratification that we're not building the future Scott Minards because he's a brain drain out of our major banks? I think you just hit the, you, you know, you, you hit it square on the head, Tom. It's up to us as the leaders because there's definitely the raw talent out there. And are we providing an environment um, where people can learn um, as Scott learned um, through trading in the U.S., through trading in Europe, through both trading and being on the investment side of being a real student of the markets and doing the homework day in and day out, the research day in and day out, keeping the relationships with the Fed, keeping the relationships with the regulators and the clients. Um, yes, the talent's out there. It's up to us as leaders to develop that talent. Bob Diamond, thank you so much. Of Atlas Merchant Capital, of Barclays, of Credit Suisse, and Morgan Stanley from a bit ago. Boy, are there some lessons there from Mr. Diamond about nurturing the talent. You think of Shanali Bassett's comment on bonus season. Where are those Scott Minards? How do you keep them? How do you retain them in 2024? And what are the new markets? I mean, in terms of the technology uh, prowess that they're trying to bring on some of these banks, where do you nurture it at a time when the market is really shifting? You know, I hear you groaning, but there is this real question about modern finance. And that was the question back in 1978 with respect to high yield bonds and the creation of a new paradigm. Yeah. And the illusions here, I think you mentioned it earlier of, of, of Mike Milken and a, and a time, and, and I go back to the visceral paper tickets, you know, Ace Greenberg and paper buys here and sells here. And we've lost that visceralness even, even in the Robin Hood world within the day trading that we've got. One thing that we have not lost is a sense of needing to pivot quickly and needing to change in a dime. And, and that is one yeah. thing and one lesson that Scott uh, <coughs> really embodied and has been pivotal, uh, excuse the pun, for this year. And we'll have to see. Futures up 10. Dow futures up 94 uh, this morning. And the 10-year yield, 3.70%. All of us at Bloomberg on Scott Minor. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, nearly 37 million people may have been infected with COVID-19 on a single day. According to the government's top health authority, some 248 million people, or 18% of the population, likely contracted the virus in the first 20 days of December. That's according to China's National Health Commission. China's dismantling of COVID zero restrictions has unleashed the virus, making its outbreak the world's largest. North Korea fired two suspected short range ballistic missiles today in an area near Pyongyang's main international airport. North Korean leader Kim Jong un is finding space to ramp up provocations against the U.S. and its allies as President Biden focuses on Russia's war in Ukraine. The launch comes three days after the U.S. sent a bomber and F-22 stealth fighters to the peninsula for joint drills with South Korea. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is committed to stand with the government in Kyiv for as long as it takes. Blinken says work is continuing to repair and defend Ukraine's energy infrastructure and bolster its air defenses, including with Patriot missiles. He discussed the war today in a call with his Chinese counterpart. The war in Ukraine is taking a toll on Russia's economy. A Bloomberg survey shows its economy will contract by 2.7 percent next year. The European Union is withholding 22 billion euros in funds earmarked for Hungary. In an economic blow to nationalist Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government, the European Commission says Hungary isn't fulfilling the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights. It mentioned a so-called child protection law that bans minors being exposed to any kind of portrayal of homosexuality or sex reassignment. Critics say it restricts the rights of the LGBT community. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The reality that the job market is just 
swimming in, in, in unfilled you know, jobs and demand is incredibly high. The consumer confidence data is ripping and, and people aren't appreciating that the consumer is going to spend a lot more money. It's going to keep us out of recession. Jonathan Golub with some optimism there to end the year. Credit Suisse Chief U.S. Equity Strategist well, and Head of Quantitative that. Research. Well, it is optimism at a time yes. when there's so much fear of recession and what could potentially happen. Uh, we're going to be speaking with someone right now who is surviving. I can just put it that way. There's a having, warming trend. Having <laughs> lived in Chicago myself, it? and it is right. rather cold there. Bianco right Town, minus eight, wind chill, minus a gazillion degrees. But they're in the back end of this. Like, this ends, and the people out west, it's warming up somewhat. Yeah, and that comes to Bianco us. Town gets back to zero about 3 p.m. today. Well, hunkered in his uh, office right now, trying not to go out, is Jim Bianco, who we're so pleased, is willing to join us, president of Bianco Research, who's had some stunning calls over this year, has really been a breath of fresh air in his real reassessment of free money and the lack of it. Jim, really, I want to start on one of the big questions ending this year, which is the discrepancy between bond markets and their expectations of what the Fed is going to do and what the Fed is saying they are going to do, which is raise rates a lot more than the market is certain, certainly allowing for. Can you end the year helping us to understand who is right? Well, that, historically, usually the market has been right. But in 2022, it's been the Fed. The market has been dragged, screaming and kicking to the belief that rates are going to go up. And while both the market and the Fed are saying, you know, the terminal rate where they're going to peak is around 5%, the market thinks they're going to start cutting rates this year, where the Fed has made it pretty much clear that they're not going to be cutting rates this year. And that discrepancy is going to pretty much, I think, drive, you know, investing in the first half of 23. Are we going to get the pivot in 2023 or are we going to get the pivot in 2024? If the market doesn't get the pivot, which it is expecting, I think it's there's going to be some room for disappointment. I guess that there's another way of asking this, which is, have we really gotten out of the woods with respect to some sort of more substantial financial disruption? Or have we seen the bulk of it in terms of the rate move and the realization that we are, we are in a new higher rate era? I think we've seen the bulk of the move. Yes, there's still more rate hikes to come. There could be as much as 75 more, 75 basis points more between now and say the spring. But yeah, I also think that whether or not we are in an era of higher rates, that's really the question. The market is still of some belief that in the next two years or so, inflation will settle back down to 2% and interest rates can go back down, you know, somewhere around 2% as well. And it can approximate something that we saw pre pandemic, where I'm more of the camp that we're in a higher rate environment now that Really, when the Fed starts cutting, you'll get to three and a half, and that'll be pretty much it. Uh, that's what, what easing will be, or maybe three, which is what easing will be in the future. And then in the next yeah. flare up, rates will go higher from there. You know, Jim Bianco, you've seen big shifts. Like, let's look at the Chicago Cubs, Landon Dansby, Cody Bellinger coming in. I mean, big shifts uh, for the Cubs going into next year. The big shift in our world, as Lisa alluded to, is money now costs something. We have a risk-free rate. We have a legitimate sharp ratio. Explain to the Ute how things change. Well, I think the big thing with that is that in 2022, we saw that the total return in bonds, you know, how much money you lost plus the income you got. Remember, you started the year with no income. You started the year with pretty much a zero interest rate. has been a record. They, we've not seen uh, Bank of America saying it's been 104 years since we've seen these kind of losses in the bond market. And you're right. I, I mean, uh, I'm a little bit surprised, too, that <clears throat> if, you, if you told me in January uh, the worst market in 104 years, I would have thought that we would have had a lot more financial disruption than we've had so far. Maybe that's a sign that, you know, rates are not as deleterious as we think and they can go even higher. But uh, nevertheless, I think as we move into 23, we're going to start the year with a coupon. We're going to start the year with an interest rate. So if prices go down, you've got a cushion now. You've got an interest rate that we haven't seen in 15 years. But does it mean, you know, you go back to 1918 and everything that happened there earlier in the year, folks, we did the collapse of Russia off the war in Ukraine and what it did to J.P. Morgan. It was really uh, something. Let's drag it forward, Jim, to 1974, and we were greeted in 75 with up, up, up. Can stocks stun this year and do a 75 or a 1982? 
Sure. And they need one thing to do that. They need signs that inflation is, after all, transitory. It is on its way back to 2% without a recession, that that's its natural long run rate, and it's going to stay there. If you see something like that, the Fed can settle down, the market can take off then at that point. But if inf inflation is not on its way to 2%, the market will struggle. I've argued that inflation in the post-pandemic era, inflation is this story, is the game, and it will continue to be. And whether or not it goes back to 2% on its own naturally in 2023, 2024. If inflation's the story, as everyone is saying that it is, how important is today's read, the last inflation read that we get of 2022, as we get a sense of where the consumer is ending the year? I think, it. you know, we're going to get PCE, and the Fed is focused on core PCE. And they've made, uh, Chairman Powell's made the case that neutral is getting the interest rates, all interest rates, sustainably above uh, core PCE's rate, which should be around 4.5 or 4.6 <laughs> when we get the number. Well, now all of a sudden that puts that interest rate uh, or interest rates within that possibility of getting above the inflation rate, something they haven't been this whole cycle. So if we see that 4.5, 4.6, and we see it trending lower, we could be getting a lot closer to at least neutral, according to the Fed. Jim Bianco, thank you so much. From Chicago, thank stay you. warm. Mr. Bianco, Bianco uh, Research, providing weather forecasts for Bloomberg surveillance <laughs> and as, as, as well. It, it, is, it, it is a seismic thing this year. And, 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 and there's three ratios you look to measure risk and reward. Sharp, Jensen, and Trainer. And you memorize these and you flunk them on a CFA exam. Thank you. But the answer is only one of them really codifies the tension because it doesn't have this goofy thing called beta. I'm not a big beta fan. And that's the sharp ratio. Except the sharp ratio has been useless pushing on 6, 7, 8, 13 years because there's no risk-free rate off of a T-bill or, off, you know, live or whatever you want to take it off of. And all of a sudden, boom, we're back to what Jim Bianco and I remember which is maybe we can actually do the math that the great Scott Minard would do routinely 10 and 20 years ago. What Jim just said there was pretty fascinating about how if we get core PCE below 4.5%, below 4.4%, suddenly you could get a Fed funds rate that is above that, that by that metric is <coughs> restrictive. And at what point is sufficiently well, restrictive Absolutely that we start to it. see where we can get a sense of where the peak is in some of these rates? Percolating. Are we already, given David Rosenberg disinflation, the super restrictive of Dominic Constum or the ultra restrictive of Ben Emmons? Peter Shear was talking about deflation he yesterday. He was calling for outright deflation and a really rapid decline uh, uh, in the pace boy, of service uh, sector. Of price increases. I, I can't well, get this there, is Peter. the issue. Well, this is the problem: is that from a goods perspective, now Absolutely you're seeing a rapid disinflation, yeah. but not necessarily in the <clears throat> services sector, and you're still seeing wages go up. Yeah. Yeah. Well. We have economic data in five minutes. It's going to be important because of what uh, Jim Bianco was just yeah. saying. And again, it's is, is the McKee, last, I think it's the last really important data point that we're going to get. Is McKee remote end. from an airport or is he like, you know. Are you just trolling me? Seriously? No. I have like anxiety heading to the airport knowing what could be potentially in store. Well, it's probably for me. holding it your be, parking spot. This should be, you know, sort of a syndrome that should be can named. We, can we say one of the triumphs of this year? The opening of the new LaGuardia Airport. I agree. It is It is one of the few, you know, look at the roads here. Look at, they still haven't fixed a pothole, you know, like one block away. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's 50 they should, Ninth Street. They should just have a big sign ahead of New York City, pothole ahead. It's just how many can you count? Coming up, Michael McKee, I believe he's not at LaGuardia. We'll have to see on that. Futures advance ahead of McKee's appearance. Up 12, stay with us. To squeeze us in in 20 seconds. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keen, John Farrow on assignment. And I must say, in this last visit of the year with Michael McKee, he is the absolute foundation of the first word in what we do, which is economics, finance, investment, and the rest of it. He's got some fancy title I can never memorize, but all I know is he holds us up every morning, and particularly now at this 8:30 with a 
Seattle slew of economic data coming out. Durable goods is the first number out. It looks a little shaky. You've got <laughs> other sources as well, a direct conduit to Washington. Durable goods is a little shaky, down 2.1% on a headline basis. Uh, we'll have to see uh, what's underneath that in j just a few moments. One of the problems is, is everybody's hitting the uh, button on the Internet <clears throat> at once. But personal income comes up better than expected, up four-tenths after a seventh-tenth uh, seven -tenth, uh, uh, rise in October. Uh, the forecast was for three tenths. Spending is up a tenth of a percent after an eight tenths rise. So Americans apparently cutting back a lot. Uh, now, the problem is uh, I'm <coughs> running into here, uh, and others are probably running into the same thing is that the uh, server at the Bureau of Economic Analysis seems to be down a, little a little too much eggnog there at the much, BEA. Uh, a little too much uh, eggnog, <coughs> and not enough people being able to get in there. All right, here we got our number that we care about. Uh, the PCE deflator, the headline PCE is up just one-tenth. That's down from three-tenths the prior month. The year-over-year -year number falls to five and a half percent from six percent. The core up uh, two-tenths of a percent. It was revised higher to three-tenths in the prior month. Uh, so that's an improvement. And we see the core deflator drop to 4.7 percent from five percent. So uh, it looks like, depending Depending on uh, what happens in this month, that we are going to come in at the end of the year below where the Fed forecast at their last meeting. Uh, durable goods, let's finish that one. Uh, X transportation two, up two tenths, and capital goods, non defense, X air up two tenths. That's the proxy for business spending, and that is uh, down right. from three tenths a month ago, which originally reported as <laughs> six tenths. So we've got sort of a, a, a double drop there. So it does look like. Uh, incomes are okay. Got to see where that comes from. And then uh, spending right. both by consumers and businesses is a little weak. I'm going to let you look at that, dive into that for first glance. Michael Gapin on deck with us here with Bank of America. But Lisa, you and I saw the two-year yield do a pop, pop, pop. Come back a little bit, but nevertheless, two-year yield up two basis points. The most important number to me is the core deflator uh, year over year, 4.7 percent. The expectation was for it to come down to 4.6 percent. So this is an upside right. surprise. You're also seeing it's sort of a <clears throat> wash on personal spending, because even though it was disappointing in terms of only rising 0.1 percent, it was revised upward in the prior month. So these are some of the right. uh, machinations behind why you're seeing a two-year yield pop. And something new on the ECO screen, folks, if, for those of you who are the terminal in your car, ECO Go, Michael McKee, inflation-adjusted personal spending is flat, flat, flat. Most of our listeners and viewers know that. What is the state of our real wage disinflation, deflation, negative wage growth as we go into the new year? How grim is it? Well, it isn't grim in terms of wage growth. Wage growth has still been strong, which is kind of something the Fed has uh, been concerned about. What we're not seeing is people spending extra because of it. And inflation now, the way it is dropping, uh, is going to put us somewhere around the level of uh, – Wages uh, in terms of growth, which is what you kind of want to see. If you want, if 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 uh, wage growth holds up, uh, and uh, we'll we'll. Uh, uh, get people get a benefit from that over inflation. Uh, that's a good thing. The only question is, uh, the Fed thinks you should get three and a half percent, and uh, we've been running in the fours. What is the read through in terms of uh, gasoline prices coming down? How much does that color the view of spending, color the view of this entire report? Well, it obviously does color it because people have more money to spend on other things if they want to. It doesn't appear like they did a lot of that during the month of November. Uh, we have to separate out uh, the services numbers from the goods <clears throat> numbers, and uh, I'm sure that Mike Gapin is uh, going to have that for you because okay. I'm still looking at this. But it right. does look like uh, at this point we pulled back a little bit in November. Now, is that because right. people were waiting for sales? Um, hard to know. Well, much more on this. Michael McKee will dive into the data and give you a nice snapshot here. We'll do that in the next uh, 30 minutes to an hour uh, as well. Right now, we are thrilled. As I mentioned, Mark Cabana working for Bank of America, the only one working yesterday. Today, the only one working at Bank of America is Michael Gape, and they're head of U.S. Uh, economics, and we're thrilled to bring him in uh, this morning. Uh, Michael Gapin, I I I've seen adjustments to Q3 GDP. We've just seen important Q4 data is Q4 growth a mystery to you, or do you have a confidence in where you stand? 
It seems like, well, first of all, good morning. Uh, happy holidays to everyone. It seems like growth will come in certainly less than what we had in the third quarter. Uh, you know, estimates are around one to one and a half percent, maybe a little closer to two, but it does think, seem like we're moderating into year end. Uh, so I'd, I'd say somewhere in that range is likely where we're going to end up. Uh, but it does, as I think um, Mike mentioned, some of the momentum in personal spending and business spending seems to be slowing as we get into year end. So I do think the fourth quarter will be running around half of where we were in the third quarter. That slowdown, and we're seeing it in the bond market now, the two-year distancing out over where it was before, 4.31%, a solid four basis point higher yield in the two-year equities, uh, fractionally on an odd day taken on the chin, uh, is, well... How far apart are the markets in economics now, uh, Michael Gapin? Not too far. I mean, I, I still think it's an open question of, you know, will we have a recession? When when will it be? How deep and long-lasting might it be? So there will be some disconnect here between, say, where equity markets are and bond markets are. And it'll be hard for equity markets to price in a downturn and kind of know where to revise earnings until we start to see some of that slippage in, in the underlying data. So certainly, the, if you look at the bond market, it is expecting, I would say, it is pricing in some mild recession in 2023 and a Fed that's forced to cut in the second half of the year. There's a little dislocation between that and, and equity markets, but you know, time will tell in, in, in this regard. So I'd say, yeah, there is a gap. Um, and that, that gap's going to narrow at some point, and, and the data's going to tell us when. I was speaking with Peter Shear uh, of Academy Securities yesterday. And he called for outright deflation next year. He said that prices are going to fall uh, and that inflation is going to fade away. How do you push back against that? Well, I think I think you push back and say 272,000 jobs a month, wage growth, and you know, in the four to four and a half percent range, kind of expected at least through the first half of the year. Uh, it's going to be really tough to get deflation unless unless what I'd call it's a bit of a mirage that some of these good prices like used cars new cars, household furnishings, that those just retrace their entire pandemic rise in, in 12 months. So that'll bring headline inflation down a lot. But underneath, I would still expect services inflation to be firm. So persistent deflation, really hard to see at this point. So I'd say it's probably a composition story, unless you think the economy is about to fall off a cliff and the unemployment rate's going to, I don't know, the Larry Summers 6 to 7 to 8% range. Otherwise, I think it's probably more just a, a goods retracement story bringing overall inflation down. But I don't think that's where we would settle in. I've noticed a real shift in tone from a lot of the people we've been speaking with. There's a new optimism about a soft landing that was not there about a month ago. Do you think that it's misplaced or do you think that there's real evidence of that becoming a greater chance of a reality based on some of the disinflationary uh, action that we've seen with goods, even though it perhaps hasn't trickled into services as much? I would say it hasn't. The data flow in the mix and, and kind of the rolling over goods prices, um, we've all been expecting that. It's, it's, it's been about kind of timing and when it would show up. It hasn't really changed my view on the likelihood of a recession in, in 2023 <clears throat> because, as I think you're getting to, it's, it's really about the labor market, wage inflation, and, and services, and the Fed's not going to feel comfortable <clears throat> that inflation will be going back to 2% right. unless it removes imbalances from, from the labor market. I don't think that yeah. picture has changed. Hey, Dr. Gabe, and I'm not a fan of the Michigan data. It's coming out at 9 o'clock, but, you know, I'm learning to follow it more and more. And the one thing I get a value there is this odd step snapshot of the public of the inflation guesstimate five to 10 years out, which is called mm -hmm. inflation expectations. It's sort of up at a 1997 level, three-ish. Are we becoming unanchored in our heart and soul out of Olivier Blanchard's wonderful new research? Are we actually becoming unanchored and towards a higher expected inflation? I don't think so. I think if we look across the University of Michigan data and the, and the other data on expectations and market implied measures, I still think we're broadly consistent with low and stable some Something around around two percent, and and I do think, with today's PCE data, the last couple CPI reports, I think it'll be kind of built in that okay, inflation is coming down. So step right. step number one, right, get inflation on a downward trend. Right. Step two, let's see if we can get it around two percent. Right. So I, I I do think 
it'll it'll become more noticeable that the rate of inflation is slowing. I don't think long run inflation expectations are are inconsistent with what the Fed's trying to achieve. Michael Gapin, thank you so much. Michael McKee diving into a raft of economic data, tried to parse out Bramo's chance of getting on an airplane today. Oh, it comes boy. down to goods and services spending. How much can she bribe whichever airline? <laughs> exactly. Is? It's a service. It's, it's a service. To it's taken. a service bribe today. <laughs> services what do you see spending there? was My up seven tenths. So open. We, we are spending still on services. It was goods that was down one percent. Uh, autos? And that, uh, that would include autos. So overall, the shift is still there, and it was heavily weighted towards services this time. And I might mention, because we <clears> talked <throat> about it, wages and salaries were up half a percent, which is the same thing. Uh, basically, they've been up over the last six months. So wages and salaries not going down at this point. Uh, but uh, if inflation is going to continue falling at the rate it is, you're going to get ahead of it. Anybody want to tell me what the market's doing? The yeah, two-year two yield's up five beeps, yeah. and I got green on the screen now. Yeah, well, things are fluctuating, trying I'm to lost. find a level. You saw an immediate plunge in uh, in, in futures, but it Oil has retraced $2. just a little bit. I mean, it went negative briefly, and now it's back up to where it was before. What the implication is, given <laughs> the disinflationary kind of trend, is still difficult to see. Well, this is kind of what the Fed wants to see. The economy <clears throat> slowing, both on the business and consumer side, inflation coming <laughs> down, and people are still getting paid, uh, suggests we're not losing jobs. And like, Lisa's getting out of Dodge today. Bramwell's going. She tra she travels like Audrey Hepburn in Charade, you know. She's got like eight <laughs> things of luggage. I thought you The were. whole matching thing. You I know, actually travel with less luggage than you do, Tom. That's I actually true. know that for a fact, so watch it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to try, we're gonna try <laughs> to get through the next 20 minutes. Are you here later today to parse Michigan and all that? I am, yes. Oh, very good. Michael McKee with that important data at 10 o'clock hour. Coming up, Bramo had a tantrum and said, get Brian. Get Brian. Brian's coming. He'll be here. <laughs> The points guy, he changed our lives. It was like the advent of antibiotics. Brian Kelly figured out the flying racket, the points guy. We're going to do that next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Paris, a shooting has left three people dead and three injured, one of whom is in critical condition. The shooting happened around noon in the 10th arrondissement in a Kurdish cultural center. A 69-year-old French man was arrested. The Paris prosecutor's office says the suspect had previously been arrested for two other incidents, including one in which he targeted, tried to attack migrants. Now, authorities say the motive in today's shooting is not yet known. Ambulance workers announced two more days of strikes in January, escalating industrial action in a bid to pressure the UK government to discuss their demand for higher pay. Nurses in the National Health Service have also walked out this month. Meanwhile, over 400 ground handlers at Heathrow Airport accepted an improved pay offer and called off a planned 72-hour strike. A massive winter storm is hitting a huge portion of the central U.S. Thousands of flights are canceled. The National Weather Service says more than 200 million people, that's around 60 percent of the nation's population, are under some form of winter weather warning or advisory, wrecking havoc on America's travel plans ahead of Christmas. In other words, Lisa Bromowitz, call before you head out to catch that flight. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Not a joke. I'm sending my staff, my staff, they had plans to leave on tomorrow, late tonight or tomorrow. I'm telling them to leave now. Yes, yesterday from the Oval Office, the President of the United States. He looked good with the green screen behind him. Going to Lowe's coming in uh, here. Watch out for the lake effect, he said. President Biden there on this storm. I don't want to do a look back. I don't want to know where Pittsburgh is right now. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene to get you moving forward. Brian uh, Kelly to be with us here, the points guy. But first, Brian from Boston. Brian K. Sullivan uh, joins us. Brian, I want you to move us forward to where our viewers and listeners across this nation will be Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. What does a weekend look like? Uh, you're stranded. 
uh, packages that you expected to arrive on time probably aren't. FedEx put out a note this morning saying that they can't uh, guarantee that um, Christmas Eve delivery uh, right now. Um, and you might be without power. You know, we're edging in on a million people without power in 20 states right now. Can you talk about the scope of this, the fact that 200 million people are under some sort of weather watch? Is this going to really wreak havoc, not only on crops, but also on uh, on livestock, on also just well-being? Right. The crops, the uh, winter wheat and the livestock are going to take the, the hardest hits, I think, and also will have the longest uh, consequences out of this. The energy sector is going to get a hit, but it, it won't last very long. A few days here and there, the prices will go up, the prices will jump around. But um, it's that longer term um, right. that crops and livestock take. Brian, you lived at the blizzard of 78 up in Boston. Is this the potential equivalent of that lovely snowfall? The snowfall isn't going to be too bad. I mean, right now, Tom, it's almost 60 degrees outside my house. I mean, there's a there's a steady roar of the wind and everything is shaking around. But, okay. um, you know, we're not going to get the snow out of this, but we are okay. going to get the battering of the coast, I think. Brian Sullivan, thank you so much. Brian K. Sullivan with us from Boston uh, today on a weather update. This is a joy right now. I usually, when I'm giving speeches, I'll say something like, you know, the two great things in America, antibiotics, air conditioning. And the other great thing is what Brian Kelly invented. He is the points guy. And whatever you say, he's a pinata for the industry. Brian Kelly changed how we travel. No way to put it. Brian, I did a Brian Kelly the other day. I took a family member, business class, the Philippines, $21,000. I did the Brian Kelly pixie dust, and I paid $56 for that trip with a lot of miles. Are those kind of things going to happen next year? Are we still going to get the mileage pop next year? Absolutely. The airlines depend on the mileage programs. You know, they sold billions of dollars worth of miles, you know, to kind of survive over the pandemic. So the loyalty programs are alive and well. But as you kind of hinted at, they're increasing the amount of miles that you need for each trip. So what I recommend to people, instead of holding your miles long term, use them now and uh, airlines like United now let you cancel your mileage reservations for free. So right. what I say, for, during storms like this, use your frequent flyer miles as a backup option. If your flight is canceled on one airline, use your miles to fly out on another. Brian, what's so important to me is the idea interview to interview with airline types, which is they're optimistic, but I don't see a lot of thrill about investing in the business. They've come off the pandemic lows in that. Are you optimistic on American aviation out of this horrific pandemic? I am because, you know, when you look at the generations, millennials, Gen Z, people want to travel. You know, wealth and luxury are these days defined by having great experiences. And luxury travel is seeing a huge increase from pre-pandemic. I don't see that, you know, showing any signs of slowing down. So I think long term the travel industry will be OK. But, you know, every industry right now, there's just so many question marks with what's going to happen in 23, unemployment, et cetera. But I'm bullish on travel. Maybe bullish on travel for the companies that arrange it, not necessarily the experience of travel for the consumer. We were speaking with Elaine Becker over at Cowan, and she basically was saying people are going to pay more to get less. How much are you seeing that reflected in what's available, the perks, whether it's access to, to clubs, to lounges, whether it's how many points you can use, as you're alluding to, for each flight? Well, you bring up a good point with the airline lounges. So starting in March, Amex Platinum uh, members will no longer be able to bring in guests for free into those Centurion lounges. There's so many uh, lines to get into the lounges. Uh, airports are packed. So, uh, you know, the experience is being downgraded. You know, I was just looking at a hotel in Palm Beach uh, in January, $3,000 a night for a normal room. It's kind of crazy how much inflation has happened in travel. Um, but consumers don't show signs of uh, pulling back because of these increase in prices. So we'll see. I, I do think there will be a tipping point where people say, this is just crazy. I'm not going to spend this much money uh, for the experience that I get. We haven't gotten there yet, though, and that's the reason why you continue to see this inflation. You mentioned hotels. What about on the hotel front? How much can you really use these point systems versus the pushback that you're seeing on the margins, certain places in the airline industry? Mm. 
Yeah, hotels are, I think, particularly egregious. Uh, you know, there are still luxury hotels where due to safety, they're not going to do housekeeping, right? I, I think that's egregious when you're spending $1,000 a night and have to Thank bank you. to have your room. Um, yeah. But overall, you know, the hotel industry actually, I think, is a lot more healthy than the airline industry. The margins there are much better. Right. But loyal, I, I highly recommend to people, use your perks on your those hotel-branded credit cards, uh, you get free nights. You know, you can pay ninety-five dollars a year and get a free night at a five hundred dollar hotel. So yeah. there are a lot of ways to play the loyalty system. Brian Kelly, I, I took Kelly three hundred two points guy three hundred two. I got a B minus, folks. I really didn't do that well on it. And Brian, there was a ratio of economy to premium economy to business class, and I've never seen it as stupid as it is now. I've looked at two recent flights where business, econ business was 10 times more expensive than economy. Where are we in two years in the mix on airplanes? Yeah, well, you know, during the pandemic, things slowed down a little bit. Business was only moderately more expensive because, you know, the companies, the banks weren't paying for those crazy high, you know, full fare business class prices. You know, the trend is now airlines are putting in premium economy. That's the sweet spot. That's where they're making money. They charge a premium, but not the 5X or 10X that you see for business class. Um, but airline pricing has always been, frankly, insane. Uh, and I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Tell me about the other side of the Brian Kelly equation, which is the charge cards. Are the banks enthused by the Brian Kelly world? Yeah, I mean, the, the banks are making buku bucks on the rewards cards. They want premium consumers, especially going into 2023, you know, thoughts of a recession, people getting laid off and not paying their credit card balances. We're seeing credit card balances for Americans in general go up uh, dramatically over the pandemic. We saw a lot of people pay off their credit. Now Americans are accruing more credit. So the banks want those premium consumers who are going to pay off in full every month. Yeah. And uh, so those people like the travel cards. And so I see a lot of uh, investment in those premium travel credit cards in 2023. Just real quick here, Brian, do you think it's a fool's errand to try to travel for the December break? I'm just asking for a friend. Well, I, I know you're you're traveling today, I think, especially out of New York, a third of flights out of LaGuardia are canceled today. So if you're going to travel, pack your patience. And I really do want to urge everyone, be nice to frontline employees at the airport. Yes, yes. You know, they are underpaid, overworked. And trust me, they want your flight to go out. Don't scream at them. They don't want you in front of them at the gate, yeah. you know. So just be nice this holiday season. And, right. you know. Brian, you know, it's a personal note. I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm just going to say it. You saved me about three months ago with Brian Kelly 101. I, I, I couldn't believe what I did on some of these international junkets my family's uh, taken. I can't say enough about it, folks. Use your charge cards carefully and wisely and try to figure out the points. An annual visit with Mr. Kelly, the points guy. Thank you so much, Thank uh, you. Brian, as well. I, I, I make jokes about it, but he's the one who made sense out of this racket, and it is a racket. I mean, let's be honest. It's a game. And he's always said that. He's always been open about if you run up your charge cards at 25% a year or 19% a year, whatever it is, they're making out like bandits to give you the miles. But to his immense credit, he changed an industry. As a young kid, he did this. I mean, it's just Can I amazing. just say, Merry Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful one cooking and making your Brussels sprouts <clears throat> and your ham. And oh, I just, uh, yeah. yeah, I just want to want to thank you and, and wish you... A fantastic holiday. I, I just got a I got a text from home here, and we're having ham. We're you know I'm going to go with the ham and and all that and two vegetables. And I'm told that for an appetizer we're having cooked squirrel. <laughs> oh yeah, cooked squirrel. That was a that was the verdict <laughs> after Bill, a number Vet of days. Bill got the squirrel out of the tree, and there's been an adaptation to the horse divorce. <laughs> your 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 home life sounds. You're just wait, we're, scintillating. Where the hell's Pharaoh? I mean, what is this? What, why is Pharaoh? Not? I'm going to start tearing up. Merry Christmas to him too, and He's have a wonderful wonderful holiday. Good morning.